cutting climate pollution and creating jobs. Calvert Cycles' historic investment in local food and yard waste recycling. Plus new funding to make redemption easier as California adds wine and spirits to its beverage container recycling program. And overrun by illegal dumping. How Calvert Cycle grants help restore farm and ranch land. Calvert Cycles public meeting starts now. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Calvary Cycles December 2023 public meeting, the last public meeting of the year. This meeting is for Californians by Californians as we work together to protect our communities and fight climate change. To serve people of differing abilities and to comply with requirements of the American Disabilities Act, Calvary Cycle provides closed captions for publicly, publicly viewed meetings because live captioning requires some voice recognition software some errors may occur. Here's information about our Spanish language interpretation. Language shouldn't be a barrier when it comes to protecting our air, water, and land. CalRecycle is simulcasting this meeting in both English and Spanish. Click the public meeting banner at the top of calrecycle.ca.gov for a link to our webcast in English and Spanish. If you're attending this meeting in person in Byron Share Auditorium, we have Spanish interpretation devices available. Let our team on the left-hand side of the dais know if you need one. El idioma no debe de ser una barrera cuando se trata de proteger nuestro aire, nuestra agua y tierra. Language shouldn't be a barrier, and so CalRecycle is broadcasting simultaneously this public meeting in both English and Spanish. You can find the link both in English and in Spanish in the Sorry, upper side of our website. GOV. Si asiste a esta junta en persona en el auditorio Byron Share, tenemos dispositivos de traducción al español disponibles. Solo informe a nuestro equipo al lado izquierdo del mostrador de presentación si necesita uno. Our first agenda item today is the director's report. Cal Recycle Director Rachel Mackey Wagner joins us now with some important updates. Good morning, Rachel. Good morning and thank you, Maria, and thank you all for being here today. It is so great to have so many people in person and for those of you that are joining remote, remotely, welcome, welcome um, through the simulcast. We really are very excited to bring today's uh, final 2023 agenda to all of you and look forward to the conversation. First and foremost, I just want to share how excited we are to uh, get our organics recycling grants out today and I'm excited to talk more with all of you about how that is gonna facilitate 7.7 .7 million tons of organic waste recycling. And as we all know, um, the importance that that play, the important role that that plays in fighting climate change and the leadership role that California has in facilitating um, hopefully global change in how we look at our organic materials, not as a waste stream, but rather as an opportunity, um, like the olive tree we were seeing earlier, um, to grow healthier and more uh, successful produce here in California and beyond. Um, we have a lot of things on our agenda today, and I know a lot of people are here um, to participate. So with that, I think I'm just going to turn it right back over, um, I think it's to Aaron, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the uh, legislation as we head into the 2024 year. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so now we'll get an update from Deputy Director Aaron Rodriguez on other changes ahead. Thank you so much, Maria and Rachel. I will go over the bills that Governor Newsom signed during the most recent legislative session, which if you can believe it was just earlier this year. Um, we will be heading into a two-year session um, in just two weeks now, so I'll do an overview of the, a couple of the bills that were signed this year. <clears throat> AB 1548. AB 1548 specifies that organic waste infrastructure, such as material recovery, sorting, and bailing equipment, are eligible expenditures under the existing grant and loan program administered by CalRecycle. SB 568 is related to e-waste e export. This bill requires exporters of covered electronic waste to declare in a report submitted by the Department of Toxic Substance Control that they attempted to locate an in-state e-waste recycling facility before exporting the waste for recycling or landfill disposal. 
Under this DTSC, Department of Toxic Substance Control is authorized to fine anyone making a false statement up to $1,000. AB 1526 is a fun one. It's a committee omnibus bill, um, and it was the Natural Resources Committee omnibus bill. It made various technical and clarifying changes to the public resource code, but most importantly and excitingly, it did add aerosol paint to the existing extended producer responsibility architectural paint recovery program. We look forward to adding those new materials into our existing EPR. SB 353 by Senator Dodd um, makes various changes to the beverage container recycling program to update the program, provide additional funding to assist in recycling centers, and a cleanup of statue. For program updates, it adds all fruit and vegetable juice, regardless of the container size, to the beverage container recycling program. It also modernizes the BCRP by providing more flexibility in who is considered a beverage manufacturer for wine and distilled spirits. For funding, it provides additional support to recycling centers and authorizes Reci CalRecycle to make changes to processing payments using either the preceding 12 or three month scrap value, whichever is lower. It also provides rural recycling centers with funding for glass due to the increased transportation costs anticipated um, with the inclusion of the new beverage container from SB 1013, which was signed in 2022. And then last, SB 613 expands the waiver for low population jurisdictions under California's Organic Waste Recycling Law, SB 1383. It allows jurisdictions that did not meet the 2014 deadline for submission of the low population waiver applications to submit required data and qualify for the waiver. And last, it extends the exemption date for jurisdictions that currently hold low population waivers to December 1st, 2028. CalRecycle will um, be allowed to renew waivers beginning January 1st, 2027. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Aaron Rodriguez, our legislative director. So today, as the director referenced, CalRecycle is announcing $130.6 million in grant awards. The department's- Food and other organic waste is half of what Californians throw away. <laughs> to help more California communities cut landfill pollution through food and yard waste recycling. But first, here's a quick look at how organics infrastructure investments are creating jobs and cutting climate pollution across the state. Okay, now. Food and other organic waste is half of what Californians throw away. Rotting in landfills, this organic waste gives off methane pollution, which has 84 times more climate heating power than carbon dioxide. To fight climate change and feed Californians, nearly a half billion dollars in organics recycling and food rescue funding is moving California to a waste-free future. It's a lot of fun to be able to say that we've taken two million tons out of the landfill. That's, that's, that's pretty awesome. Across the state, CalRecycle Organics Recycling and Food Rescue grantees are working to cut climate pollution equal to taking over 830,000 cars off the road. With organics recycling infrastructure projects turning a major source of climate pollution into circular economy climate solutions. That grant made a huge impact for this facility. It also allowed us to go out and get the equipment that we wanted to get. The new storage tank, which is funded by Cal Recycle, is pretty much doubling the amount that we can accept, helping grant recipients turn formerly landfilled material into products like biofuel to power fleets and businesses, and compost to help soil retain more water make our food more nutritious, and to pull planet heating carbon from the air. At 100,000 tons a, a year, we sell out every year. We can't make enough compost to, to, to serve the valley right now. Now $130 million in new organics infrastructure investments will help accelerate California's climate progress. Instead of those harmful materials being placed into the landfill, they actually will be turned into valuable products that help increase our climate resilience helping California lead the nation on climate action to keep food, yard, and other organic waste from creating methane pollution in landfills. As 75% of California communities now report organics collection for recycling. By recycling organic waste, paper, cardboard, food waste, green waste, we can have an immediate impact on battling climate change. And I think that's really empowering to know that I can actually do something about it and I can actually realize the benefits of it in my lifetime. And now the Division of the Circular Economy Deputy Director Zoe Heller joins us with the latest Organics Grant Awards. Good morning, Zoe. 
Good morning, Maria, and good morning, everybody. I know you've heard this number a couple of times now, but we're just very excited to announce that $130.6 million will be going out the door to 23 applicants to support 1383 compliance. If you look at the map, you can see the geographic diversity throughout the state, and awards include seven compost, seven anaerobic digestion or co-digestion, five standalone pre-processing, and five in-vessel projects. These grant-funded projects will, keep, will cut climate pollution by over 2 million metric tons, and that's an equivalent to keeping 445,000 cars off the road. They'll also create 114 new jobs in California. Back to you, Maria. Next, we have an SB 1383 implementation update from Director, Deputy Director Kara Morgan, who is joining us remotely today. She's the Deputy Director over Materials Management and Local Assistance. Good morning, Kara. Good morning, Maria. And I'm so sorry I can't be there in person, um, but I'm happy to see you all remotely. So this next agenda item concerns an SB 1383 Article 2 alternative technology determination. I'd like to begin with a little background on the purpose and scope of Article 2. SB 1383 requires California to implement strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, like landfill methane emissions from disposed organic waste. Under SB 1383, a reduction in landfill disposal must reduce the physical presence of organic waste in landfills and reduce those associated greenhouse gas emissions. Article two of the regulations identifies the activities and operations that meet the standard. It also contains a process to evaluate operations or facilities not explicitly listed under article two. As explained in the request for action on the monthly meeting agenda, an article two technology determination is limited in its scope and application. The determination allows a technology to count as reduction in landfill disposal for purposes of SB 1383 regulations if it achieves the required greenhouse gas emission reductions. For clarification, Article 2 is not an endorsement of a technology. It does not constitute a permit or a permit approval. It does not impact existing or proposed solid waste facility permits. It does not constitute a license or certification and it does not mean a proposed technology deemed to be a reduction in landfill disposal under SB 1383 would not be considered landfill disposal under other related laws. A project would be subject to all statutory and regulatory requirements, including CEQA, permit review, and approval processes, and must comply <laughs> with all other existing statutes and regulations. Now I'll turn to the Article 2 technology determination application submitted by H-Cycle in July of 2023. Power Cycle, in consultation with the California Air Resources Board, determined the application was complete. As part of Calorie Cycle's commitment to transparency, the H-Cycle application documents were made available for public review and comment. An email request for comments was sent via our SB 1383 short-lived climate pollution listserv. The 30-day public comment period was held from August 15th through September 16th, 2023. Calorie Cycle received 19 comment letters, which are attached to this agenda item. H Cycle's application includes operational controls, record keeping and reporting, and third-party verification to ensure a facility using this technology achieves the required greenhouse gas emission reductions in practice. A life cycle evaluation of the application was conducted by Cowrie Cycle in consultation with the California Air Resources Board. Cowrie Cycle also included additional monitoring and verification procedures that will be effective at determining if a facility using the technology described in the application is achieving the required amount of greenhouse gas emission reductions in practice. These are detailed on pages eight and nine of the request for action. Any finding by Cowrie Cycle that the H Cycle technology as described in the application constitutes a reduction in landfill disposal is contingent upon these monitoring and verification procedures and controls being in place. 
if these procedures are not followed, any determination that the technology does represent a reduction in landfill disposal will not be applicable, and any waste sent to such a facility likely will be deemed disposal. Cal Recycle staff, in consultation with the California Air Resources Board, reviewed H-Cycle's application and found the permanent life cycle greenhouse gas emissions reduction is equal to or greater than the emissions reductions from composting organic waste and can be determined to be a reduction in landfill disposal under the analysis and methodology prescribed by our regulations in 14 CCR section 18983.2. The additional monitoring and verification procedures and controls that I have mentioned will allow CalRecycle to validate that the technology described in H-Cycle's application will continually achieve the permanent life cycle reduction in greenhouse gas emissions requirement. The application details, staff's analysis, and public feedback are included in this agenda item and can be found on the public notice linked in today's agenda. Based on the information and analysis provided in the request for action, including the additional monitoring and verification procedures, and as required by 14 CCR section 18, 983.2 action is needed by January 16th, 2024. Back to you, Maria. Thank you, Kara. Uh, we have just been informed that CalRecycle's website is experiencing technical difficulties and is not accessible at this time. The Cal EPA video player accessible through calepa.ca.gov is still working. But we are, while we are working to get this resolved as soon as possible, we want you to know that a recording of today's public meeting will be available online in the coming days. And we'll have that in both Spanish and English. Moving on to new laws in the new year as California advanced, oh, sorry, this was the part we already did. <laughs> Um, so uh, we're just 12 days away from the wine and spirits joining the California Bottle Bill. The program has worked to keep nearly a half trillion beverage containers off of our streets and out of landfills in the past three decades. Here's a quick look at what's changing in the new year. California starting January 1st, all wine and liquor containers and choosing a bottle or can will be added to the beverage container recycling program. That's right. You can take these containers to a recycling center or participating dealer to redeem your deposits. Here are tips to help you understand the changes. You can redeem any wine, liquor, or juice bottles with or without a CRV label on the containers if you pay a CRV when you purchase the item. Plastic, glass, aluminum, and bimetal containers less than 24 ounces have a 5 cent CRV value. Containers 24 ounces or more have a 10 cent CRV value. You can also redeem wine and liquor boxes, cartons, and pouches. Those containers have a CRV value of 25 cents. Non-alcoholic beverage boxes, cartons, and pouches are not part of the program. Bag and boxes must be intact. Bag, box, and spigot as a single unit to be redeemed at a recycling center or retailer found on Cal Recycles website. Help us cut litter and trash by redeeming all of these beverage containers. Get more information at RecycleCRV.com. California's historic bottle bill reforms also include new funding to make redemption more convenient for Californians. Deputy Director Zoe Heller will share more in the next agenda item. California has collected more than 491 billion bottles and cans since our bottle bill took effect. We are working to push that number even higher with a $40 million in redemption innovation grant funding to support innovative recycling programs like mobile recycling, reverse vending machines, or bag drop programs. Also support for existing and new recycling center businesses, new opportunities for dealers, and community service programs and outreach efforts. For dealers existing in new recycling centers, grant awards can range from $500,000 to $3 million. For dealers, reverse vending machine projects and community service projects, grant awards can range from $75,000 to $300,000. Projects that provide CRV redemption in disadvantaged or underserved communities will be given priority. You can read more about the funding criteria linked to today's agenda. The grant application will be available soon this winter. 
So thank you for our participation in our Beverage Container Grant Webinar and providing comments to help us shape this program and others. So speaking of others, um, additional support for beverage container recycling includes 10 million in grant awards for the local <coughs> conservation cores. Um, projects focused on beverage container litter cleanup and collection in underserved areas. Each eligible applicant will be awarded an equal share of the $7 million is a base grant award. The remaining $3 million will be production based. Applications are set to open next month. The application for the Workforce Development Grant Program is also set to open next month for $5 million in grant awards to support employment and training for new workforce to provide California consumers with convenient opportunities to redeem CRV. Applicants will be required to submit a workforce development plan. CalRecycle will soon post more information, including funding details, eligibility requirements, and deadlines. We will be sending the criteria out on our listserv and welcome your comments through the end of the calendar year. Up next, we're announcing a $1 million award for California RVM Solutions for the Sacramento County Beverage Container Recycling Pilot Project. The project will include redemption opportunities like bag drop, reverse vending machines, and a traditional wait and pay method. Consumers can print a voucher for immediate cash payment or be paid electronically through the California RVM Solutions mobile app. Today we also have a new Farm and Ranch Cleanup Grant Award. The program has helped clean more than 1,000 illegal dump sites so far. Let's take a look at a recent Yuba County cleanup before we get to the new award. A peach orchard is flourishing again in the heart of Yuba County after a $154,000 Cal Recycle funded illegal dumping cleanup. I would say there's easily debris out here dumped at least once a month. The piles of trash grew so much in this orchard and neighboring properties in the Central Valley community of Olivehurst that they were visible from Highway 70. Yuba Sutter County Resource Conservation District says it has been able to remove over 100 tons of waste to date. We've had anything from tires, sofas and couches, refrigerators, freezers, washers, dryers, wood scrap. Illegal dumping was slowing down operations at the Peach Orchard, threatening employee safety and raising concerns about fires and toxic contamination. All of those waterways within the orchards and next to the levee systems, it can contaminate the fish habitat, wildlife habitat, and go into the river and on downstream. Grant-funded gates, signs, and surveillance cameras are now in place to keep illegally dumped trash from spoiling the harvest, giving the land back to farmers to feed Californians. Today, CalRecycle is announcing over $180,000 in grants to three applicants, including two resource conservation districts in one county. You can read more about each project in today's agenda. Grant funds will be used to restore these lands and install signage and fencing to prevent future illegal dumping. We're announcing $6 million in funding to 187 local governments as part of CalRecycle's Used Oil Payment Program. Created in 1991, the program helps local governments develop and maintain used oil and oil filter collection and recycling programs like used oil drop-off locations, oil filter exchange events, curbside collection programs, and outreach events. These programs help California recycle over 98 million gallons of used oil every year. We are also announcing 1.5 million in Household Hazardous Waste Grant Programs awards to 25 applicants. Since 2005, the program has expanded HHW collection programs to keep 1.5 billion pounds of household hazardous waste out of our communities and out of our landfills. The latest round of grant awards will support local waste reduction, collection, and recycling of HHW. 29 communities will receive more than $4.8 million to pave local roads using recycled tires to make rubberized asphalt, concrete, or rubberized chip seal. Beyond the environmental benefits, this material performs better and lasts longer than traditional asphalt. It also reduces costs for local projects since the material can usually be applied half as thick as conventional asphalt overlays and can last up to 50% longer. California kept over 12.2 million waste tires out of landfills and communities thanks to this grant program, which is funded, funded through a $1.75 fee on the purchase of new tires. All right, moving on to our loans, we also have a recycling market development zone loan announcement today. 
PINPAC Capital Holdings will use its 3.5 million RMDZ loan to purchase and upgrade equipment to recycle more material. The company uses recycled bottles and clamshells to make new food grade packaging, which is also recyclable. The upgrades will increase recycled material use from 2,800 tons to over 5,800 tons per year. And I just want to acknowledge we made a lot of announcements today on grants and loans, and that's due to the commitment of our grants and loans team and all of our supporting staff. So just a big thank you to them. This is, um, these are big projects that make a, a huge difference on the ground. Back to you, Maria. Thank you, Zoe. And I'm happy to tell you that CalRecycle's website, calrecycle.ca.gov, has been back up for the last few minutes. We apologize for any inconvenience. I also want to give you a quick reminder about upcoming grant deadlines. Applications are due next month for farm and ranch cleanup grants, beverage container recycling city county payment program awards, and the community composting for green spaces grant program. To more fully engage with Californians on our pub monthly public meeting agenda items, CalRecycle is moving to an all live public comment submission process. Instead of submitting written comments online, you can now address <coughs> agenda items directly with CalRecycle, either in person or over the phone during the public meeting. Here's how. California wants your input on recycling and trash pollution issues. Join CalRecycle's decision-making process by making a live public comment on any of today's monthly public meeting agenda items in person or by phone. Microphones are available for those of you in the room with in-person comments. If you're joining remotely, you can call in with your comment. Just click the public meeting banner at the top of our website, then click the public comments button for step-by-step -step caller instructions. We will address live public comments at the end of the meeting. It sounds like we already have quite a few uh, callers in queue, but we will be addressing comments uh, in just a few minutes at the end of the meeting. So CalRecycle is working to implement historic circular economy reforms, and I wanted to remind you that there's still time for interested parties to submit SB 54 producer responsibility organization applications. The deadline is January 1st, 2024, just around the corner. More application information is available on our website. Draft regulations are coming soon as the department continues to host informative workshops. Sign up for our SB 54 listserv for updates. And now Deputy Director Zoe Heller will give us updates on our other extended producer responsibility programs. Thank you, Maria. We have a brief pharmaceutical and sharps waste stewardship program update. On October 15th, the foundation resubmitted its 2022 annual report for covered drugs which staff is currently reviewing for compliance. The statutory deadline for the director's compliance determination is January 16th, 2024. So more to come on that next week, next week, next month. Um, be sure to sign up for the PharmaSharps listserv to receive updates. The carpet stewardship law requires a carpet stewardship plan to include a contingency plan that demonstrates how the plan will, be continue, will continue to be carried out should the plan expire or be revoked without the approval of a new plan. CARE submitted its contingency plan on October 20th as an amendment to its 23 to 27 plan. CalRecycle reviewed the plan amendment and determined that it does not meet the requirements for approval. The director disapproved CARE's plan amendment on December 5th, 2023. CARE may revise and resubmit its contingency plan amendment within 60 days after receiving the notice of disapproval. That'll be February 5th, 2024. The notice of disapproval can be found in the public notice linked on today's agenda. Back to you, Maria. Next, we have an update to AB 1201, which passed last year to address California's growing composting stream. Materials Management and Local Assistance Deputy Director Kara Morgan will share the next updates. Thanks, Maria. AB 1201 requires a public process for CalRecycle to determine whether it would be feasible to separate the collection of products that are not acceptable feedstocks under USDA's National Organic Program from feedstocks that are acceptable. Also, would it enable efficient processing to recover organic waste in both streams? In other words, recovering organic waste means processing both organic streams into marketable compost and not collecting a stream that will then be disposed. If CalRecycle determines 
that separate collection systems would be feasible, the department must adopt regulations by January 1st, 2026. If CalRecycle determines separate collection is not feasible, it will be illegal as of January 1, 2026 to sell products in California that are labeled compostable or home compostable unless those products are acceptable compost feedstocks under the National Organic Program and meet other requirements. As part of our public process, on October 16, 2023, CalRecycle posted a discussion paper summarizing the survey results from 34 mixed material composting facilities permitted in California. CalRecycle then conducted a public workshop on November 1, 2023 and presented the results of the survey. The survey responses indicate that bifurcated collection of products would not enable the current solid waste processing infrastructure to efficiently process and recover products that are not allowable compost inputs under the national standards. CalRecycle evaluated all submitted comments and additional comments which you'll find attached to today's agenda. No data was provided that demonstrates that bifurcated collection is feasible and would enable efficient processing and recovery of organic waste using the current organic waste processing infrastructure in California. The request for action provides a summary of all of the written and verbal comments that CalRecycle received. Action is needed by January 1st, 2024. Next on the agenda, CalRecycle will be hosting an upcoming workshop to provide an overview of the 2022 California Waste Tire Market Report on January 19th from 9.30 to 11.30 um, in the morning in the Coastal Hearing Room. This report describes current markets for scrap tires in California overall and by market segment, which include rubberized asphalt and concrete, molded and extruded products and others, civil engineering applications like tire derived aggregate and current information on alternative daily cover use, export and disposal. Workshop attendees will be able to participate in person or remotely. Next, I'll talk about uh, covered electronic waste over 2.6 billion pounds of electronic waste has been collected and processed in California through our covered electronic waste recycle program. To keep covered e-waste off our streets and out of our landfills, CalRecycle is requesting required net cost reports from approved collectors and approved recyclers in the covered electronic waste recycling program covering operations during 2023. These reports help establish payment rates for both covered e-waste recovery and recycling. Reports are due to CalRecycle on or before March 1st, 2024. My next item, CalRecycle is required to review and either approve or disapprove each countywide or regional agency integrated waste management plan five-year review report. These reports are comprehensive analyses of planning documents which may be impacted by changes to demographics, disposal, capacities, funding, and diversion programs. Alameda County submitted a five-year review report for its countywide integrated waste management plan. No revisions to the county's planning documents are necessary at this time. This item has been approved. Back to you, Maria. Thanks, Kara. Now to pending solid waste and tire facilities permits updates. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's a quick overview of California facility standards, plus a statewide facility permit update from Environmental Program Manager Paulina Lawrence. Protecting the health of Californians and their land, food, water, and air is a big job. Local, state, and federal agencies play different roles to enforce public health and environmental safety standards. In California, solid waste local enforcement agencies process applications, issue, and enforce permits for solid waste facilities. These include landfills, transfer stations, compost facilities, or similar operations. CalRecycle must verify permits are consistent with state requirements. Permits can only address areas within the authority of local enforcement agencies and CalRecycle. Check out the link below for more detailed information. Emergency waivers allow temporary changes to solid waste permit requirements in response to local or state disasters. 
Local enforcement agencies may approve the waivers, which are good for up to 120 days and may be extended. CalRecycle must review approved waivers and can condition, limit, suspend, or terminate them. Check out the link for more detailed information. For waste tire facilities, CalRecycle processes applications, issues, and enforces waste tire permits. These include requirements to make sure tires are stored and processed in a way that reduces potential threats from fire and disease-carrying vectors like mosquitoes. Check out the link for more detailed information. Continuing on this month's agenda for San Bernardino County is the City of Claremont Community Services Department. This is a new solid waste facilities permit. Action is needed January 8, 2024. Also continuing on this month's agenda for Orange County is Bee Canyon Greenery. This is a compostable materials handling facility. Action is needed December 31st, 2023. Also continuing for Yolo County is Yolo County Central Landfill. This is a revised solid waste facilities permit. Action is needed January 19, 2024. New to this month's agenda for San Diego County is Otay Mesa Compost Facility. This is a new compostable materials handling facility permit. Action is needed January 20th. 2024. Preliminary review of the permit package indicates the following proposed design parameters. The proposed facility will be a compostable materials handling facility that will receive green material, food material, vegetated food material, agricultural material, and construction and demolition wood waste. Permitted hours of operation will be 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Permitted volume will be 500 tons per day with a permitted area of 7.13 acres, and lastly, a design capacity of 30,000 cubic yards. Also new to the agenda for Ventura County is Mountain View Organic Waste Processing Facility. This is a revised solid waste facilities permit. Action is needed February 3rd, 2024. Preliminary review of the permit package indicates the following proposed changes updating the name and mailing address of the owner, addition of a large volume in-vessel digestion facility activity, updating the permitted maximum tonnage to include 100 tons per day for the in-vessel digestion activity while maintaining the total maximum tonnage of 300 tons per day, updating the permitted area to include 0.28 acres for the in-vessel digestion activity while maintaining the total permitted area of 1.49 acres and the addition of a design capacity of 104 tons per day for the in-vessel digestion activity. Also new to this month's agenda for Orange County is Madison Materials Inc. This is a modified solid waste facilities permit. Action is needed February 3rd, 2024. Preliminary review permit package indicates the following proposed changes. Updates to the findings section, permissions, and prohibition section. Documents that describe and or restrict the operation of the facility section, the self-monitoring section, and the local enforcement agency conditions section. You can find more information on any of today's agenda items. Just go to CalRecycle's homepage, calrecycle.ca.gov, and click on the public meeting web banner at the top of our site or the public meeting section a little further down for a link to the agenda and associated public notices. Now it's time for live public comments. First, we'll take comments from those participating in our Sacramento Calipia headquarters meeting room today. Oh, lots of comments today. After that, we'll take comments from those participating by phone. And for those on the phone, just a reminder to mute your microphones. Um, your microphones will stay muted until you'll, you're called by the last four digits of your phone number. Also, please mute your webcast to avoid potential feedback issues. Good morning. Hello, Evan Edgar, live from Sacramento. I'm here today on Edgar Associates representing the California Compost Coalition. This is the best of time for composting and the worst of times for landfills. 
Composting has all types of solid waste permits up today, and landfills are a super emitter of methane, so that's why we have SB 1383. And I want to con congratulate Cal Recycle for issuing $130 million in grants today. What that does, it leverages four to one of the private and public capital. So that add that 130 million to 520 million of, of investments on a four to one ratio, we're investing two thirds of a billion dollars in infrastructure. And the SB 1383 needle will move about eight to 9% for the 770,000 tons a year. So it's a big move. But that's only getting eight or nine points on a 75% rate. So in the future, we need more of this type of grant activity. You guys do a great job there. What Cal EPS has shown in CARB in their, um, in their annual report on cap and trade dollars is that the most cost effective program is compost and AD, about 50, 60 bucks a ton. ZEVs are about 1,000 to 3,000 a ton for greenhouse gas. So you guys are doing the right stuff at the right time. Plus, we know from the Cal EPA report that the benefit for dis disadvantaged communities. Um, each one of these grants awarded today had a community benefit agreement. You got five points, but an extra 10 points for bonus points. And all these C CBAs, community benefit agreements, have great community benefits such as edible food recovery, jobs training. So you see a lot of good stuff that is coming out of this grant program, and we need more of it. We also know that California is in a budget deficit for six to eight billion, and next year we won't see too much money. Under the typical, typical cap and trade program, without the surpluses of past, it was about 25 million a year is what been going to cap and trade to the Cal Recycle Infrastructure Program. So that's about 50 million in two years. And on your B list, a lot of good projects on your B list is add another 58 million. On a B list, over the next two years, we may be able to move, uh, move some more tons. But the future doesn't look bright for um, funding um, compost and AD. We may need some green bond measure. We may need a tipping fee increase at the landfills. If you need some type of revenue increase in order to sustain the infrastructure development to get to 75% by 2025 or 2030. But today is a great day for Cal Recycle, the best of times for compost. Thank you for issuing the grants, and you actually moved the needle today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Edgar. Good morning. Nick Lapis of Californians Against Waste, actually commenting on three different items on the agenda. And I think Mark is batting cleanup afterwards on a few of the other items. Uh, first of all, on the item that Evan mentioned, I do want to commend you for getting the money out the door quickly and efficiently. I know it seems easy to hand out money to the general public, but I'm very well aware of how difficult it is for you all. And you know, frankly, this is us putting our money where our mouth is. And I think SB 1383 was a bit of a leap of faith in terms of will there be funding, will there be state support? And I think your ability to fund good projects and to do it effectively has been uh, the reason why you've gotten additional funding over the years and why this infrastructure is being built. So congratulations on that. On uh, AB 1201 bifurcation, I, I think you all reached the obvious conclusion. I, I think it's frankly self-evident. Um, actually, you haven't said what conclusion you've reached, but reading the, the RFA, it seems pretty clear that you're headed in the direction of reaching the obvious conclusion that bifurcation is not feasible. Um, in my mind, that's a bit of a box checking exercise. Like, yep, obviously not feasible. And we still have the rest of the bill to implement. And I think implementing the rest of the bill will determine the future of compostable plastics in California, the future of compostable plastics in SB 1383 implementation, in SB 54 implementation, in a variety of different programs. And so I would just urge you to also take on the other parts of that bill. Uh, namely, uh, choosing third-party certifiers. Once you choose a third-party certifier, they have uh, manufacturers have one year to start using that certifier. Similarly, you have authority to create uh, guidelines for labeling to reduce deceptive labeling. Um, you have a few other uh, uh, other tools in the 1201 toolbox that I urge you to start working on now that the bifurcation is is done. And then finally, on H cycle, uh, I, I don't think I'm saying anything I haven't said to you in person and in writing multiple times, but I think some of it bears repeating. I mean, what it comes down to is that we urge you to adopt option two to reject H cycle's uh, SB 1383 technology determination. 
you have a clear ministerial duty to implement your regulation as it is written, and we do not believe you have done so. We've laid out a variety of issues, and uh, most of the ones we've raised have not been addressed either in the revised application or in the monitoring requirements that CalRecycle has added to, uh, from the last go around. Just a couple of things I wanted to flag, and again, we've submitted multiple items, but uh, you know, the regulations require explicitly that we use a conservative baseline. And th there's some assumptions in here that are, in my opinion, definitely not conservative. Uh, for instance, I think the biggest emission reduction benefit in the, in the whole calculation comes from product displacement, which is replacing diesel fuel with hydrogen generated from this facility. I think assuming that there's gonna be diesel fuel through the life of this project, and it's gonna be used in these fleets as inconsistent with existing car regs, industry practice, where we're going with the uh, zero uh, emission fleets, that seems like a completely unsubstantiated assumption. Uh, I also wanna highlight that there has been a serious lack of community input here. You've had community members from all over the state ask to really talk about the specifics of where would these projects go, what the impacts would be. The, the department and the agency have standing practice to support environmental justice communities. And at the core of that is looking at cumulative impacts on those communities. And I realize you're not permitting a facility here but you are making a decision that will have impacts on individual communities. And from the ones I'm aware of where this is being proposed, uh, they're all incredibly disadvantaged communities. The legislature just passed uh, a bill a year ago creating a new Office of Environmental Justice at CalRecycle. And in the legislation, the explicit goal that was listed was uh, ensuring meaningful involvement of disproportionately burdened communities in department de decision making. I understand maybe first time around when the, the application was before you, you needed to act quickly, you might have not had time to engage with the communities, but it's been a year since then and you have still not, even though multiple people have requested that. And finally, um, I did want to just point out that this is a discretionary action by the department and it is a discretionary action being done pursuant to an EIR that was adopted when the SB 1383 regulations were before the department. The EIR very explicitly looked at technologies and the impacts of the technologies that would be used to meet 1383. It specifically looked at what impacts composting and anaerobic digestion would have, both negative impacts and positive impacts in terms of uh, production of soil amendments. Uh, and in fact, the alternatives analysis in the EIR really only looked at two alternatives. One having to do with a different scope of edible food generators, which isn't necessarily relevant here. The other one was whether or not biomass facilities should be part of the scope of the regulations. So, and the alternatives analysis found yes. But it was very clear that the EIR looked at a specific range of technologies and the impacts they will have. Uh, relying on that EIR, to approve this determination is not appropriate. Thank you. Thank you for your very thoughtful comments, Mr. Lapis. Good morning, Julia Levin with the Bioenergy Association of California and I too would like to make three points. Um, and I'll maybe pick up where Mr. Lapis left off and say we strongly support the application of age cycle and believe that approving an article two determination is completely appropriate and, and very much needed. Both the governor and the president of the United States and the international climate community have all called for extremely rapid increases in the production and use of clean hydrogen as a critical tool to achieve our climate change goals and ensure energy reliability and protect local air quality. Um, California recently was awarded up to $1.2 billion for a clean hydrogen hub in California which explicitly is focused on both electrolytic hydrogen and hydrogen from organic waste. But to obtain the entire $1.2 billion, we have to show rapid progress in the development and production of clean hydrogen in California. And H-Cycle 
is one of the very first projects poised to meet the requirements of the California Hydrogen Hub. Um, in response to Mr. Lapis's comment that we don't know whether it will be used to replace diesel, every assessment from the California Air Resources, Air Resources Board and the California Energy Commission and the U.S. Department of Energy has concluded that we are going to need renewable hydrogen to replace diesel in heavy-duty trucks. We're also going to need it for a lot of other clean energy applications, like replacing diesel in backup generators for electricity reliability, long-duration energy storage, and a whole host of other uses. So if we're lucky, and there are other alternatives for diesel trucks in the future to address Mr. Lapis's concern, there will still be a virtually infinite need for clean hydrogen to replace other fossil fuels. So either way, it's going to provide enormous benefits. It also provides enormous benefits to the local community. Clean, really good, long-lasting jobs, longer lasting than most other forms of renewable energy because there's ongoing waste processing collection needs that don't exist with things like solar and wind. They have a different role to play. Um, but those are really significant economic benefits and local air quality benefits. I live in Contra Costa, Contra Costa County, where the age cycle, the first age cycle project is proposed, as well as the Raven project in Richmond. And diesel trucks are the largest source of air pollution. There are several interstate highways that intersect those communities and that are served or used by an awful lot of diesel trucks. We have to get those trucks off the road. And the only viable alternative right now is a hydrogen fuel cell truck that can run on clean hydrogen, or even a hydrogen combustion truck would be a big benefit to local air quality over diesel trucks. We can't wait for something else to come along, potentially decades from now. So we do strongly support approval of the Article II determination. The science is absolutely behind you, as is state and federal policy. The second point I want to make is to echo Evan Edgar's comments and thank you Really, I don't even know how to say it strongly enough for getting this money out the door. We're seeing other programs that are almost certainly going to be scrubbed because of the state budget deficit. So the fact that you moved quickly on this funding and are going to be funding so many important beneficial projects, um, I just hope you write the checks before the governor's January budget proposal comes out. So there's no risk to that funding. But it is, it is going to do an enormous amount of good in meeting the requirements of SB 1383 in reducing methane and other pollution from landfills and providing compost, clean energy, and other beneficial projects in its place. And that brings me to my third and last point. I think we're all terrified of what the budget deficit is going to mean. And I think it's incumbent on everyone in this room, and, and the Bioenergy Association of California would like to work with everyone in this room to ensure that we find you new sources of funding for next year and the coming years. because. Even with the great work you've done and what you're announcing today, we've got a long way to go. And so we've got to find other sources of funding to keep the momentum going on SB 1383. So thank you and keep it up. Thank you, Ms. Levin. Good morning, Veronica Pardo, Resource Recovery Coalition of California. I'll try to keep my comments brief, uh, brief building off of uh, Julia's excellent comments. Um, we really support the comments from Director Morgan, who described the robust scientific analysis and the monitoring and verification of the technology that you know you're looking to approach in Article Two determination. You know we support this determination today, but more broadly, during the SP 1383 process, we supported that portion of the regulations in order to account for these you know, burgeoning technologies or technologies like that aren't even burgeoning, obviously, with hydrogen production, but acknowledging that we have a lot of pathways needed in order to manage the organic waste that we produce in California. And if we're going to be diverting from, you know, the sanitary landfill, we need to have these options. And was as, as described, we are doing this huge transition in our transportation sector where we're going to be needing these fuels to support um, that clean energy transformation. So very grateful for... Uh, your comment, the, com the SP 1383 funds, and some other comments that we'll be providing later on um, the bifurcation determination and beverage container recycling program, recognizing that those comments are coming up. So, thank you so much for your time today. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Tom Hansen. I'm the business manager at IBW Local 302 and the president of the Contra Costa Building Trades, and I'm here in support of H Cycle. A speaker earlier spoke about our communities and generalization, and I'm here to tell you I represent the workers that live in those communities, and his comments were disturbing. We are not opposed to what H-Cycle is doing. 
In Contra Costa County, we have four oil refineries. Two of those actually just are changing to renewable diesel. They're planning for the long run to make diesel for many years to get back the billion dollars each of those plants spent. What we're looking forward to is H-Cycle and companies like H-Cycle coming to Contra Costa County and developing the next green technology, and it is hydrogen. Not everything can be battery powered. I'm an electrician, I know about electricity. You cannot have everything run on electricity, it's impossible. We need H-Cycle and companies like H-Cycle to build things in Contra Costa County. Tim Grayson, the assembly member from our area, put forward a bill called the Green Empowerment Zone. Their plant will be part of that zone. In Contra Costa County, we have what's called the Northern Waterfront Initiative. That is in, in that. This will be built in an old Dow facility site, a brownfield. We will see cleaner technology, but actually have legitimate real world jobs, not fast food jobs in that area because of H-Cycle. Not to mention the construction jobs will be created because H-Cycle is partnered with the building trades. So all the hours worked to build this plant will be built by middle class jobs with family sustaining wages, with health care for themselves and their families, and also a pension so they can retire with dignity. H-Cycle is coming to town to build something good for California, and he's helping the workers out at the same time. So please support their initiative. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Tom Hansen. Tom Hansen. Thank you so much, Tom. Appreciate you joining us today. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for making time to hear all of our public comments. Um, I'm the president of the Bay Area chapter of the Environmental Justice League. Um, also previously served on AC Transit Board of Directors in the Bay Area, who's just awarded the best transportation, public transportation agency in the country. So, you know, one of our big initiatives was hydrogen fuel cell, as I'm sure you, you know, and, you know, it's been a big um, impact in the Bay Area. You know, I live in East Oakland. I'm actually here with some speakers who you'll hear, and pollution is a huge issue. Um, I don't have to tell you anything you don't know, cancer rates, asthma rates, all of the issues that went along with redlining, putting things in black and brown communities, I see every day. You know, I live in the part of Oakland where um, on International Boulevard where you're having lots of traffic, you're having the freeways there, you have uh, trucks going to the port. I mean, there's a lot of pollution. And this solution that H-Cycle is pr promoting is something that we're doing in the Bay Area with hydrogen fuel cell, and I'd love to see it in Pittsburgh. I have family out there. This is not something that's theoretical. This is actually gonna help. And I, I didn't even know about the part with the labor. I'm a huge supporter of labor, so it's good to see that people in the community are gonna be building this facility, are going to be able to retire, as you said, in dignity with a good pension. And, you know, H-Cycle is, is talking good game, and we appreciate it, and we just want to be partners with them and make sure that they're following through on their commitments. This isn't something where we're just here to be a shield and say, build it and get back. We want to be there with them step by step to make sure, you know, everything happens. And as the gentleman before me mentioned, it's a little bit disturbing to have someone make a comment about our communities. I mean, you look in the room, it doesn't look like a lot of people that look like me are here. I, have, I brought people here from Oakland. We were up at 530 to be here to make these public comments. So I agree with them about public comment, having outreach, you know, having people that are in the communities. And we, we, we made our, our, our way here because we this is very important, not just for Oakland, what it will do for Oakland, what hydrogen is doing, but for the entire Bay Area region. And, you know, all of this money coming down from D.C., then from the, the money that the Biden administration has made possible. I mean, it's the best of both worlds. You're getting technology, cutting edge technology that is going to make a difference in people's lives, that's going to be built by people from the community with union wages. I, I, w w there's not much else you can ask for. I mean, we could ask for the moon, but we're not going to get it. So we have to live in the here and now in a practical reality. So um, the Department of Justice League wholeheartedly supports this project. We hope that you will support the project as well. We're looking forward to many more um, facilities being built in the future. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, your name, sir? Mark Williams. Mark Williams. Mark, um, I'd like our Deputy Director for Environmental Justice is uh, here. And so if you wouldn't mind uh, leaving your contact information, we would love to connect with you. I will do that. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Test. Hello, my name is Mark Williams Sr., his dad. I grew up in West Oakland. There was Coke, Pepsi, 7-Up, Carnation, and many of trains that were coming through, the brake dust coming from these trucks. I personally believe that what you guys are doing, I'm behind 100% for the simple fact that I have asthma. When I took my test, they stopped me after two hours because they said I stopped breathing 89 times an hour. There's only 60 minutes in an hour. I stopped breathing 89 times. We need this to pass. If anything, I appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate you coming.
My name is Yvonne Ishman, and I live in Richmond, and I address my concerns to Ms. Wagner, and I'm concerned about the clean air that we don't have in Richmond, and the children in the parks are playing with portable air um, carriers. So I would like to read this letter. It says, this is regarding harnessing clean oxygen for improve, improved maternal health and emission reduction. I'm writing to express my enthusiastic support for the promotion of clean hydrogen as a solution that reduces fossil fuel emission and contributes to improve maternal health. Maternal health is a critical concern that reflects the broader state of healthcare systems and environmental exposure. These factors increase maternal health risks for black women and their babies, and also brown babies because we're predominantly Mexican and black who are three times more likely to die during childbirth than their white counterparts. The combustion of fossil fuel is a major contributor to air pollution and greenhouse gas emission, leading to adverse environmental and health effects. The transition to hydrogen power transportation can have a positive impact on maternal health by reducing air pollutants that poses risks to both mother and their developing fetuses. Lower levels of particular matter, nitrogen oxide, and other harmful emissions in the air can contribute to healthier pregnancies and reduce instances of respiratory issues, ensuring a safe and healthier environment for expected mothers. I strongly urge you to champion the adoption of clean hydrogen technology as a comprehensive solution to address both emission reduction and maternal health improvement. Thank you for your dedication to these critical issues and for your efforts to create positive change. Your leadership and commitment are essential in, invest in advancing this vital cause. I wish I had brought pictures to show you the children with their oxygen masks trying to play. Unfortunately, I think we're all very familiar with those pictures. So thank you so much for being here today, and thank you for reading your letter. Appreciate you being present. And I just want to let everyone know to make sure you get... Thank you for the opportunity to come before you. My name is Tina Flores, F-L-O-R-E-S. I'm from Richmond, California. I live blocks away from the um, Chevron gas um, refinery in Richmond. I grew up with all my friends and families. They either have some kind of thyroid issue or uh, asthma or some kind of blood disease from the environment. I work in West Oakland. I live in Oakland, in East Oakland. I'm the president of a worldwide medical relief organization. My minor is in medical anthropology, so I know a lot about um, the environment and what is having an impact on our health. We are all calling, praying, running to bring awareness to the environment. We have to save Mother Earth. I want to have you really take into consideration the H-Cycle uh, project that they have I believe in it. I believe that they will honor the community by in, including them in the decision making of having that, uh, that project in their city. That town has suffered also. We have a run that is every four years. I would like to complement that run with this prayer of this meeting today with the acceptance of this project for the H cycle. I'd like to run with that as a victory for the state of California to show the nations around the world that we are aware of the issue of Mother Earth and the destruction of, that is having on our young people in their health. Like my, my brother from East Oakland, Mr. Williams, he's a walking angel. He is proof 
that we have these medical issues that we have to address. I want this H cycle approved at yesterday. They're including the community that is harming, the refineries are harming this particular community and we have to do it now. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate you attending. Good morning. My name is Adrian Moore Gonzalez. I'm a statewide organizer for Environmental Justice League, and I'm here in support of H Cycle. After getting people together in the community meetings and hearing the commitments made to them, I'm here to allow their voices to be heard and have an impact to make sure that H Cycle keeps their commitment to marginalized communities. The immediate health impact in communities we represent have suffered from the air pollution of fossil fuels. Clean hydrogen's only pollution is water and something that we can use more here in California. I've worked with congressional members, state senators, and assembly members on many environmental bills to help California operate using clean energy. The approval of h Hydro's application will honor California, especially marginalized communities in the Bay Area, and honor the initiative Gover Governor Gavin Newsom and President Joe Biden wants clean energy. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for your comments. Good morning, my name is Mark Orcutt. I'm the president and CEO of the East Bay Leadership Council and I'm a resident of Contra Costa County. Um, the East Bay Leadership Council is a nonprofit representing hundreds of employers in, uh, across the private and public sector in Contra Costa and Alameda County. Our history goes back 80 years in that community um, and we advocate uh, every day to strengthen our economy and improve quality of life for all. Um, EBLC's work works constructively with numerous cities in Contra Costa County who are looking for solutions that will help them meet their obligations under SB uh, 1383, as well as other key laws governing uh, waste management. Through this work, it's become clear that the waste industry needs additional means to comply with the mandates of 1383, adding H-Cycle uh, to the hydrogen process as a compliant technology for landfill diversion is an important signal uh, for the state's intention to act. And this decision will bring benefits on many fronts for our community. Um, I'll, I'll just close, I know there's lots of other folks here to speak with. Landfills are continuing to see uh, not only methane releases, uh, but other problems, as noted in a recent article in the LA Times regarding LA County landfills. The industry needs more technical solutions, such as H-Cycle, and we're excited to be at the forefront of innovation with H-Cycle and our community in Contra Costa County. Uh, thank you for your support. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you for your comment. Good morning. My name is Anthony Viscuso, and I'm a business agent for Local 16 Heat and Frost Insulators, and I, too, am here to speak in favor of the H-Cycle project. Um, I represent more than 600 members who will directly benefit from this project. I also represent that I will also represent the apprentices, the new apprentices who will be afforded a path to the middle class when this project creates those next jobs. I'd like to applaud H Cycle for their consideration of not only California's strict environmental standards, but also their responsibility to the workers who will build and maintain their facility. By executing project labor agreement, they are ensuring that middle class wages will be paid to the next generation of energy workers. Many of my members risk losing their careers as California moves away from oil refinery. This project provides a just transition as the wages will remain constant and the skills they have already mastered will be the same skills needed to build this project. I believe this project is something that everyone should be able to support. Remember, opportunity isn't missed, it simply goes somewhere else. And to that point, I'd like to comment that you know, we do have a lot of refining in California. In California, we've refined under the best standards anywhere in the world. And H-Cycle has the opportunity to take this same manufacturing somewhere else and do it somewhere else. Are they going to do it to the same standards we do it in California? No. So I'd strongly encourage you guys to support this, and I thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your comments. Appreciate your perspective. Hi, good morning. My name is James Ashcroft. I'm the business agent for the Iron Workers Local 378. I represent 25 men and women workers that live in and around Contra Costa County. We're all in some strong support of the H-Cycle LLCS waste to hydrogen process, which will play a critical role in solving for organics diversion in California. We support the agency's push to explore the development of the new and innovative collection 
and processing technology with a focus on SB 1383 compliance. And along with that, bringing in all the new apprentices to come and build this project and to maintain the hydrogen plant once it's up and running. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your comments. Good morning, my name is Jason Lindsay. I'm president business agent of Iron Workers Local 378, uh, representing those same 2,500 workers that live around the uh, different areas of the county. I myself live in Antioch, just a couple, couple miles up the road from uh, where this proposed project is gonna be built. I stand here in strong support of it. There's no silver bullet, right? We all realize that there's no silver bullet uh, that's gonna help, that's gonna fix this problem. We can't on one hand say there's an existential threat to, to the planet and then sit back and say, oh, well, we need to look for the perfect solution. We need to explore every idea that's out there and those that are proven, like this one, need to be deployed. Uh, I'm conflicted, I stand here as a building trades guy who's made my career working in the oil refineries. You know, in 2019, there was over 160 million worker hours reported in California's refineries. That is a whole lot of families being fed, a whole lot of careers being built along with whatever they build in those refineries, right? So it's very hard for me to stand here and say, let's get away from that and go to something else. There's also all these terms that people throw around like just transition. This project and others like it are the just transition that everybody's throwing around there. Um, we need to build them. We need to employ and deploy every opportunity we can to <coughs> clean up the air. So thanks for listening to me. Thank you so much for being here and for your comments. Good morning. My name is uh, Timothy Jeffries. I'm the international representative for the Boilermakers for the state of California and the stand with the, stand with the building trades. I'm also executive member of the Contra Costa Building Trades and it's been said before, so I'll just kind of keep it brief and short that these are the jobs, that, that high paying jobs, middle wage jobs, building local economy around from Northern California that my brothers have already spoke about uh, previously here. So um, supporting this cycle and we are all want to be, if we're not, we should want to be environmentalists. And instead of going down just one path, allowing that to be many a path that should be available to us should be definitely the direction we're moving forward in. And I commend you for what I assume you're gonna support this measure of eight cycle. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Mark Moliner. I am the Northern Regional Director of the State Building and Construction Trades Council. Um, I'm a big supporter of uh, H cycle. Um, the State Building Trades represents 14 affiliates, and our affiliates represent 500,000 union construction workers, 83,000 which are state accredited apprentices. When you're talking about um, a green, just transition, it's got to be multifaceted. It's got to be carbon sequestration. It's got to be hydrogen. The oil refineries right now, the two of them, the Phillips 66, they are, they are getting rid of crude oil conversion and going to biodiesel. That's because everyone's paying attention. Our members represent construction workers. That's who we represent. And they go out there and make a living in these refineries and in these new technology jobs, and they want a middle-class wage, they want an opportunity for their children to be able to get into the trades, and they want to be able to give and live in the communities that they work in. With this new technology going to be built over there, this is going to open the door for a lot of other entities to continue to convert, and I can tell you right now, I drive a diesel. I love my diesel, and until the technology gets to where I can do the same life with, with the new technology that I can currently do with my diesel, I will be, and I'm 53 years old, I will be one of the first people in this industry to convert over to that hydrogen industrial commercial vehicle. If, if it does what I need it to do, and it won't unless we continue to move forward. Right now we're moving forward together. Union jobs, union skilled and trained apprentices and journeymen, and new technology to clean the environment and help us with global warming. I just want to say we are once again in support of this project, State Building Trades. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today and for your comments. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, board members. 
My name is uh, Chuck Leonard. I'm the political representative for Plumbers and Steamfitters Local 342. I currently have over a thousand members working in four oil refineries. 30 of my 40, over 30 of my 40 years in this union has been with hard hat and work boots in this industry. And it's kind of a unique place that we're in. I stand in support of the H2 uh, cycle project. We built the oil refineries. 40 years, we've been building oil refineries. And now I find that my grandson is fourth generation and he's building plants in those same refineries that are now replacing oil. And it's gonna take a lot of courage to move forward. And it's gonna take a lot of courage from everybody to move forward as we work toward carbon neutrality and net zero by 2045. And so our partnership with the environmental, the environmental justice community, uh, with our legislators, with labor, with everybody, we're all working toward the same goal. And so I would strongly encourage um, to recognize the value and the benefits that this project will do for the members, that for my members, for the community, uh, unintended consequences is when we do nothing. And I mean, let's be clear, the thousand workers that I have working in oil today, they are the fence line. They are from the fence line community. They are the black and brown community. These are the opportunities that render and give uh, folks that I didn't graduate from high school, but I'm living proof that who you are in the end doesn't have to be who you are in the beginning if you have opportunity. And hope is, com comes in many shapes, fashions, and forms, but it also comes in a job, a job that's linked to an education, a job that's linked to health care, a job that's linked to retirement. And so my members that I, and I promise you that my members are not the affluent folks that are living in Contra Costa County. My members that are working there are, have the same needs of, of everybody, and we're worried where our next job's gonna co come from. So that's, that's the challenge, but with many challenges, there's opportunities. So I, once again, I stand in support and hope that you'll uh, put a lot of thought when you render your decision. Thank you. Very much appreciate you being here and thank you for your thoughtful comments. Good morning, my name is Sarah Belafronte. I'm the assistant to the city manager for the city of Pittsburgh and I manage our environmental services division. Uh, Pittsburgh is, um, you know, one of the disadvantaged communities that was uh, spoken about earlier today. We're about 75,000 uh, residents, and as a historically uh, industrial community, you know, we look forward to um, businesses like H Cycle coming in and um, helping the evolution of industry in Pittsburgh um, continue uh, the. Uh, like I said, evolution of the industry towards green hubs, towards sustainable tech, um, <clears throat> and continue the employment of uh, local people in Pittsburgh. Um, we are. Uh, we also look forward to opportunities that H Cycle brings for um, uh, diversion of local organic waste. We have both a um, recycling and transfer station and a landfill sited in Pittsburgh. So those opportunities are exciting for local organics to be diverted um, out of the landfill. Uh, lastly, the city just adopted its first climate action plan and responsible and innovative uh, solid waste management are absolutely integral to helping us um, reach our um, the goals that we've set in line with the SB 1383 diversion mandates. So um, obviously speaking in um, support of the uh, Article 2 uh, application today. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and for your comments. Hello, welcome. My name is Joe Gatlin. I'm the founder and vice president of the NAACP for the Los Angeles Harbor area and recently appointed by Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass as a Harbor Commissioner. I'm right here in full support, full support of 1383. And for many reasons, our family was one of the first to even sue the ports for environmental reasons and also for jobs over 50 years ago. I've been fighting this fight for a long time. I also want to mention that I had the privilege of representing one of the world's 
number one environmentalist for over 50 years. Uh, I was a Western United States representative for Dr. Jane Goodall. Again, environmental causes is something that's important to me. Right now, the jobs it'll create, the environmental needs myself, for example, I didn't know what asthma was until three years ago. Then I found out that I have bronchial asthma because I live in this zone. To have an organization such as H-Cycle to help clean up the air is overwhelming to me. So I support it 100%. And we can do something that also creates good jobs for our community and stop this, I call environmental racism, we've been living under. There's those in our community are forced to live close to a refineries or the Port of LA because of jobs and transportation. To have someone like this organization will stop this, it's, 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 it's so emotional for me. I, I'm trying to calm down, but this is so great. And I wanna thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. And I'm sorry, sir, I didn't catch your name. My name is Joe Gatlin. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And if you wouldn't mind um, uh, introducing yourself to Katrina as well, we'd love to get your contact information so we can stay in contact with you. You have your co well, even better. You're well prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning, Director Wagner. Uh, Zoe, good to see you, staff. Uh, Quentin Foster, I am the Vice President of Policy and Government Affairs for H-Cycle. Um, I will say for the record that we are supportive of the staff analysis and for the record really want to uh, appreciate Kara Morgan and her team. I have been very fair and impartial in working through this process to get to this point. Uh, I had a whole list of notes here that I was going to use and I prepared it and took time and was excited to speak to it, but I was inspired by a lot of the comments that were spoken here this morning. And so really briefly, I just want to provide a personal anecdote. I think that will kind of book in some of this. Um, for those of you who know me and I've worked with many of you in this room before and some of you sitting up there, I grew up in Watts, Los Angeles a stone's throw from where the 105 freeway was built. I too, as a kid, wondered why my nose was bleeding when my friends and I were outside playing football in the street, oftentimes having to run around trucks that were sitting right across the street from my house idling. Didn't know at the time what that was, but learned later in life what we were dealing with and those impacts that had an invariable imprint on my life and why I've done the work that I've done. I get a lot of questions asked. What made you join H-Cycle? Why that company? For the majority of my career, I've been fighting for many policies that we've been fortunate enough to move and push in the environmental justice and environmental arena, some of which I very strongly believe in, and many of which were predicated on the ideal that we would be contributing to a circular economy, job creation, environmental benefits, that would not leave communities behind as we progressed. And yet here we are still talking about some of those green jobs and that circular economy. And you've heard multiple voices tell you that many of that have not matriculated into those communities just yet. I was attracted to this opportunity because I saw uh, uh, <laughs> the potential for me to actually put into practice what I've been advocating for for multiple years here to be part of a solution that could actually create jobs, provide environmental benefit, exploring and incentivizing the transition to hydrogen fuel cell from diesel trucks, which we know based on what Mr. Gatlin said is a huge component of the pollution impact. And also too, the ability to create a local impact where the community would actually benefit in this economy from these facilities. And I'll be honest with you, when I first heard about it, I was skeptical. Is that real? That sounds too good to be true, man. <laughs> but follow the science, right? Your staff did that. 
in conjunction with the Air Resources Board. They followed the science, they vetted the data, and the recommendation is what you have before you as a result of that vetting and that process. And it's why I trust it, and I'm asking you to trust it. And let me just say to everybody in this room, I am so grateful and appreciative for all of you, including my friend, Mr. Lapis, who I worked with when I was the climate director for Environmental Defense Fund. His heart's in the right place. I think he's wrong on this, but his heart's in the right place. And so I look forward to working with you all and for you to hold us accountable. That's what this is all about. We are extremely supportive of the verification measures that are in the analysis. We want to make sure that we are held to that standard. We're not shirking it, which is why we're going through the local EIR process and through CEQA and taking all the steps we need to take and being transparent about it because we don't want to, I don't want to be part of an ideal that isn't accountable in delivering what many of these folks stood here to talk about today. So thank you, including you, Mr. Lapis, for your comments, Director Wagner and staff. We look forward to working with you, hopefully as we continue to go throughout this process. But I just wanted to provide that personal anecdote for you so you know where I'm coming from. This is both a great professional opportunity, but it is personal for me, and that personal implication as a result of what I've gone through in living what many of these people talked about instead of just talking about it is why I'm up here and why I'm proud and excited to be a part of this process. So I really appreciate the time. I appreciate your staff. Look forward to answering questions if you have them. I have a subject matter expert with me and hopefully working through the rest of the process with you to address a growing environmental need and a problem we hope to be a solution to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Appreciate you sharing your story with us as well as being here. Good morning. Uh, John Kennedy with the Rural County Representatives of California. We represent 40 of the state's 58 counties. I'm here on a different issue, the AB 1201 bifurcation uh, feasibility analysis. Um, we, as, as rural local governments, have been on the forefront of 1383 implementation. We are very concerned um, and think that bifurcation of organic waste is not feasible. Uh, a determination that bifurcation is feasible would massively complicate and increase the costs of our 1383 organic waste recycling uh, collection and recycling efforts. Um, I, again, will be brief because we submitted pretty extensive comments on this, justifying our decision uh, and finding that this is not feasible, uh, both from the processing perspective, which I think your staff has spent a lot of time on, but also from the collection and sorting perspective as well, which we think uh, would also support that finding of not being feasible. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Kennedy. And we have seen your comments. Uh, Director Wagner, team, Mark Murray with the Environmental Group, California's Against Waste. I also think Mr. Lapis's heart is in the right place. Um, I, I really appreciate the spectrum of issues that you folks have to deal with at these meetings and really um, your thoughtfulness and patience in terms of listening to all of us with all of our various concerns is, is very much appreciated. Um, I have three non-H cycle um, issues that I wanted to just kind of bring follow up on my two of my letters in the last 24 hours. Um, so number one on the, I'm gonna call them the IR, RIG grants, um, we appreciate 99% of the grants that you've announced today and really appreciate all the work and time that's gone into those. We think that this particular grant proposal is not ready for prime time. We'd ask you to press the pause button on that and meet with stakeholders one more time to see if we can refine that proposal to better reflect the what I think are the, the market needs for the recycling collection community and hopefully modify those, those proposals so that it can better support the existing recycling community so that they can expand their operations to the sites where we need them. And I think that that's a finite problem that needs to be solved. We know the regions where we need these recycling centers. 
Um, we know the, the stores that need reverse vending machines, and I think a more focused and targeted grant program that is more right-sized for the recycling community um, would be more effective than the outline that's pro been proposed thus far. I mean, just one example is, I'm not sure there's a minimum grant. Um, 500,000 is a huge amount of money for a recycling center. I think maybe a maximum grant right-sized for a buyback recycling center for a reverse vending machine would be appropriate. Um, the second item, um, the plastic market development incentives, payments, I'm gonna keep calling them incentives, plastic market development incentives. Um, you know, you guys do a fabulous job of workshopping issues and getting input from folks. I must have missed it on this one. You've proposed a substantial change in the PMD incentives, and I wasn't aware that there was any kind of discussion about that. Number one, I think that your instincts are pretty good in terms of thinking that there's an opportunity to update that program to make it more responsive to market conditions. We've had a super up and down market with regard to PET. PET, what happens to PET, we used to say this about aluminum, that what happens to aluminum makes or breaks the recycling infrastructure. Today in California, what happens to PET recycling makes or breaks the infrastructure. Um, two years ago, the value to the recycling community of PET was more than $105 million for the year. Now it's $33 million. You're having to make up that dis disparity with increased processing payments, which came out this week, and we really appreciate the increased um, processing payments for, for PET. But if we can get the market to work better, we can get back to the days when 50% of the cost of recycling PET was covered by the scrap value for that material. So again, I think that the, the proposed plastic market development incentives are not ready for prime time as they've been outlined. Some of the language in them, um, I'm not even sure that your division of recycling staff would actually understand it because it's, it's mixing, it seems to be mixing certified processors with reclaimers. So I, I think it could go with another run through before it becomes official. The, the final item may be a question, um, but that is that current law with regard to program payment rates, the commingled rate, requires an annual adjustment in that. The department is required to do not less than once a year, but more frequently as necessary. Um, looking at 2024, it is definitely necessary to update the commingled rate for collection programs and curbside recycling programs. The statute gives you, has a April 1st date and annually thereafter. So if it is your intent to make that adjustment ahead of April 1st of 2024, I, I think folks could live with that. It might be nice if the payments were retroactive to January 1st. We recognize it may be necessary to go out in the field to conduct a new commingled rate analysis to determine what's actually happening. But just to know in the past, you've actually calculated the amount of wine distilled spirits in your commingled rate calculations. So the past commingled rate assessments that you've done have had that number in it. So, you know, that could have helped informed uh, a commingled rate that could go and could have gone into effect on January 1st. So maybe that's a question. Are you thinking you're gonna adjust that program rate, the commingled rate um, for 2024? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Mr. Murray, and as always, um, appreciate your thoughtfulness and detail and would be happy to have discussions on all of these points with you and, and happy to set up a time to, to meet, um, to go through the specifics. We did make a consideration of that, but because we anticipate that the wine and distilled bottles will hopefully be funneling through our redemption centers, we think that the uh, amount coming through Bluebin should very hopefully decrease significantly. 
Um, so with uh, uh, the addition of the, the, the glass, but also the other materials that will be coming through um, with the 353 additions of the, the larger size juice containers, we think we need to go back and do um, evaluations of that stream coming through the blue bin before setting that commingled rate. And I think we are having a hearing today. That hearing is on for the 2025 rate. Yes. So what are we going to do in 2024? We're holding the rate as it is for 2024. All right. I'm uh, looking forward to having a conversation. We're happy to have a conversation with you, Mark. I, I and think, I'm yeah. not sure that the statute authorizes you to not do a, a commingled rate under these circumstances. Again, we don't have, because of the change in statute, we don't have a sense of what uh, the materials will be coming through the redemption centers versus the blue. But anyway, we can have set, yeah, set a, a time to chat. Always happy to do that. One. Christy Pistoni, Waste Connections. Happy holidays and what a great day to be here to hear all of this good conversation about the future and clean hydrogen. And I know our heavy duty fleets um, that are going to be hauling materials uh, across the state are going to need hydrogen to get their job done and also provide clean air in all our communities, no matter where you live. Um, I just wanted to um, comment again about the bifurcation. I did comment on the, at the hearing on November 1st. I did not send in a letter. Um, I've been a composter for um, most of my adult life. Um, 35 years, I actually do um, some of the certification with CDFA and OMRI, so I understand how bifurcation um, would be super cost prohibitive, and I don't know how we would bifurcate our compost field and all of the equipment. So to me, it just doesn't make sense. It's also, uh, I believe with SB 54, we're gonna get to a cleaner um, product as far as packaging goes. I think the packaging industry is gonna um, learn how to make compostable materials that are truly compostable and um, more, um, synergist with, if that's a word, with the soil, okay? So uh, the last thing we wanna do is um, spread PFAS and other chemicals back in the, in the soils that we're growing our vegetables and fruits in. So really important, and I think through the SB54 process, we'll get there. Um, lastly, I've commented a few times on this bottle bill reform and the rulemaking. I've sent multiple notes back and forth. Sometimes I'm getting answers, sometimes I'm not, and sometimes it's evolving through the process. But we, we operate and have operated multiple small, I'm going to use the um, coin small uh, buyback centers throughout California in rural communities like Calistoga, Mammoth, Tehama, El Dorado. Um, and I know that we're talking about adding a half a trillion new products to a program where the facilities have been reduced in half, and now we're at 1,200 sites. We're gonna add another half a trillion uh, products to it, and I just can tell you right now with our team, we're very concerned about where we're gonna put this stuff and how we're gonna process it. And if we're gonna to move to 2,000 pounds of um, one ton of glass per customer, our facilities will not be able to comply with this requirement. And so unless you can come up with a tiered, you know, we're a, a one, a two, or a three, small, medium, large uh, RC center, uh, I don't know how we'll keep up. And so we may have to convert some of those centers to bag drops because we will not be able to compete with um, what's gonna come our way. Specifically, we operate in rural communities that are located in wine countries all throughout the state. So it could be potentially very problematic for us. And lastly, uh, I wish the new container types were part of SB 54 because they're multi-layer packaging, which is what SB 54 is all about. And so we currently don't have markets for that, which means Cal Recycle is now in a wish recycling place. You're, you're at January 1, we're gonna, you're gonna be part of the wish recycling movement. So I just like to say, I'm not sure what we can do about that, but um, it'll be interesting to unfold. Thank you.
I so, so, so appreciate your comments. Um, Christy, can we set up a time to, to talk specifically, actually, on all of these points? And I would like to just put a fine point, not to add to your comment, because I don't typically do that, but on, um, on compost, not only not having materials that degrade our compost, but shouldn't everything that go into, goes into our compost, shouldn't it be an, an additive that we want in our compost, as opposed to just the fact that it, it can break down in compost? Shouldn't it be something that's positive? So that's, that, that's what we want to work with all of you on, is how do we make, you know, you, you talk about uh, being from the wine country. I envision California compost as being the, uh, the California wine of compost. <laughs> it is how do we uh, create a new market that every uh, state, every country wants California labeled compost. So anyway, sorry, I, I shouldn't be in an advocacy position, but I just, I, I couldn't resist. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, George Hanover, Conservation Management. Um, I just want to echo what Mark Murray said on the redemption for buyback, not for buybacks, for curbsides and um, collection programs. I think it's very important that they're able to get the, the additional redemption on these products because you have people that are going out and collecting from bars and restaurants and the bulk of that material from them in many cases, at least by weight, is the wine and liquor. And what you're saying is that for a whole year, they won't be able to get any redemption on that. It will be at the same rate. And the same thing goes for most people that recycle today at buybacks will continue to and they will bring wine. Most people that don't and use their blue bin will continue to put it in their blue bin regardless of what that container is. This is over 50 years of experience for me in this business, helping write AB 20, 20 years ago and working in it for many, many years. So just comment, and I appreciate what everybody had to say. I learned a lot here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. Appreciate the comment. Are there any other comments in the room today? Okay, so now we'll go to the call-in comments. And again, if you're calling in, your microphones will stay muted until you're called on by the last four digits of your phone number. Also, if you're calling, please mute your computer sound before you start speaking so that we don't have an echo. Do we have any callers? Uh, yes, Maria, we have about 12 calls in the queue. We'll take them in the order they were received. Um, caller with the last four digits, 4200. I'm gonna ask you to unmute right now. Um, please state your name and affiliation. Uh, next up is going to be caller who's labeled iPhone exclamation point. Um, so uh, caller with the last four digits, go ahead and um, state your name and affiliation. Hi, my name is Demlis Johnson III. I am a district representative for Supervisor Federal Glover here in Contra Costa County. And I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to express strong support for Egg Cycle. Um, ways to hydrogen process, which will play a critical role in solving for organic diversion in California. We support the agency's push to explore the development of new and innovative collection and processing technologies with a focus on SB 1383 compliance. Multiple reporting sources cite that the state's waste haulers and processors working with municipalities will continue to face difficulties with organic diversion, primarily due to limited capacity and feedstock contamination impacting anaer anaerobic digestion and, compo and composting as SB 1383 tools. We are excited to work with Egg Cycle to help construct world-class solutions that will tackle several California goals of utmost importance to the environment, namely SB 1383 and SB 32, and the state's goal of carbon neutrality by 2045. Adding the Egg Cycle waste to hydrogen process as a, com as a compliant technology for a landfill diversion is an important signal to the state's intention to act. And this decision will bring benefit to many fronts, including reduction in landfill methane associated with mixed organic and the, and the post MRF MSW streams, otherwise heading, heading to landfills. We believe egg cycle complements the existing composting and anaerobic digestion industries. Egg cycle creates green hydrogen using non-combustion th thermal, thermal technology 
which will help hard to which will help hard to decarbonize industrial and transportation sectors, lower emissions, and can also help municipalities comply with the procurement provisions of SB 1383. Eight cycle projects will make significant investments in clean infrastructure, benefiting the host communities with tax revenue, jobs, and help curb pollution from heavy duty trucking. Over, <clears throat> excuse me, over 175 average local union construction jobs over a course of 15 months. Landfills are continuing to see not only methane release, but other problems, as noted in recent articles in the LA Times regarding LA County landfills. The industry needs more technical solutions, such as H cycle. These solutions are distinctively circular and with waste otherwise going to landfill being repurposed to help defossilize substantial ind industrial sources and heavy-duty diesel trucks with a clean alternative to fossil fuels, which will help improve local air quality concerns. We strongly urge Cal Recycle to move swiftly in this determination of H Cycle's Article 2 designation and approve this much-needed pathway to addressing a critical growing and environmental risk. Once again, this is Dimless Johnson representing Supervisor Federal Glover here in Contra Costa County, and he wholeheartedly supports this project. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, I'm going to ask iPhone exclamation point to unmute. And next in the queue is Clifford Post. iPhone exclamation point, go ahead with your name and affiliation if you can hear me. All right, next we're going to go to uh, Clifford Post. I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute. As soon as you're unmuted, go ahead and share your name and affiliation. Uh, yes, my name is Cliff Post, and I am with Our Planet Earth. However, um, this is a little out of order. Um, the person that will be speaking on behalf of Our Planet Earth is Bob Davidouk, and his uh, phone number is ends in 4250. Four two five zero. Let me look for him here. I'm sorry. It's two four five zero. Four five zero. I'll go ahead and ask him to unmute right now. Thank you. All right. Go ahead when you're ready. Hi, this is Bob Davidouk, and I am the co-founder of the company Our Planet Earth. We're a completely vertically integrated recycler and manufacturer of recycled pet containers for the food and beverage industry located in the city of Vernon. Today, I'll be making comments about the proposed use of the recently appropriated funds for the Plastic Market Development Payment Program. I'm speaking on behalf of my company and several of the other pet reclaimers operating in the state. There's a grave concern with the changes to the plastic market development program and have a lot of questions. We would like the opportunity to provide input and formally ask for a workshop before the department implements the changes. Reducing market development payments in some of the proposed tiers to reclaimers and manufacturers below the current levels will further undermine a historically weak market for PCR PET in California. While seemingly creative and well-intended, the proposed payment tiers appear to misunderstand current market conditions that have lasted for well over a year and will likely result in the further loss of California reclaimers and end-use markets. Last week, the department's tracking of pet scrap prices showed they are at a historically low level of $147 per ton highlighting the extremely weak market demand from the beverage and thermoform industry for recycled PET. The prices are 40% below the average for the last decade. We strongly support a greater investment and in development of California markets for recycled PET. However, the specifics do matter. This new payment system seems to hurt the companies most in need of these market development payments. All of the California wash line operators are struggling with each company in the sector doing its best to survive in a very challenging environment. 
where low-cost virgin and recycled PET imports from Asia have depressed, have depressed pricing and dealing with operating costs that are much higher than out-of-state or out-of-country reclaimers. Due to much weaker than expected demand, it has forced each reclaimer to make very difficult decisions, including reducing run hours and unfortunately having substantial layoffs of personnel during the year. The plastics that go through this program can be recycled multiple times, including thermoform containers. My company purchases post-consumer curbside bales that contain thermoform container. They may contain up to 20% thermoforms. We recycle the bottles and thermoforms together in a flake form and make new recycled PET preforms for the beverage industry and thermoforms for food, produce, drinking cups, and other types of applications. Bottles made from our preforms contain recycled post-consumer thermoform content. It is very important, and we believe that CalRecycle should encourage the recycling of all types of PET containers. Our goal and the state's goal via SB 54 and other legislation is to close the loop on all plastic containers and not favor one at the expense of others. All right. Um, thank we you. Urge, I'll we go urge ahead. the following. I have a, a, a few more comments. We urge the following for manufacturers to be eligible for the higher tier one payments for exceeding minimum PCR content requirements specified in AB 793. 100% of its purchases must be from California generated process and manufactured PCR PET. There should be equal payments for both manufacturers and reclaimers of $20 million each with no distinction between reclaimer PMD payments for processing A grade, which are deposit center bales, or B grade bales, which are curbside bales, and equal payments per ton for the manufacturers of bottles and thermoforms. The statute under PRC 14549.2, the department shall consider the minimum funding level needed to encourage in-state washing and processing of empty plastic beverage containers collected for recycling in the state. Given the current and expected market conditions, the reclaimers need a PMD that is at a minimum consistent with a tier one payment of $75 per ton to be able to stay competitive. Over the years, California has witnessed a number of pet recyclers and related businesses failing, including Carbon Light, Echo 2, and Replanet Redemption Centers, which closed several hundred redemption centers and lost 750 jobs. Without a strong base of reclaimers to process the large amount of post-consumer plastic that's collected in the state, the material will end up being shipped out of state for processing or being landfilled if there are no buyers for it. Both are outcomes that are diametrically opposed to the state's enviable goal of having and growing a circular economy. The department has a history of being open and transparent. We urge CalRecycle to withdraw this substantial change to proposed PMB payment structure until the department has convened a public meeting or workshop with stakeholders so that any new payment structure is workable and responsive to market conditions and program objectives. Thank you very much for your time and allowing me to speak today. Thank you so much. And can I ask, you had some very substantive comments, so could you make sure to um, send those directly to um, the department um, and to the uh, Beverage Container Recycling Program? Um, um, thank you so much. Of, of course, we'll gladly follow up with that. Thank you, Clifford Post. Any additional comments? Um, it does not appear so. Next, I'm going to uh, ask uh, caller 4727 uh, to unmute. Um, so I'll go ahead, and then next up will be Paul Lee. Caller 4727, go ahead when you're ready with your name and affiliation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Passwalk. I'm with the San Francisco Environment Department. Um, my comments aren't necessarily tied directly to today's agenda, so I just want to make sure that um, I'm submitting them correctly first. Uh, we open the public meeting to um, obviously anything on our agenda, but if there is anything directly related to the work that CalRecycle is currently doing, please feel free to comment. Okay, thank you. Again, uh, my name is Eric Passwalk with the San Francisco Environment Department. 
I am the zero waste coordinator for uh, construction and demolition. Um, in support of California Green Building Standards Code and the mission of CaliCycle to reduce, reuse, and recycle California resources, San Francisco has developed local ordinances to oversee the collection and processing of construction and demolition surplus materials. This support has evolved over the years from a primary focus on downstream material recovery rates to an increasing recognition of the importance of upstream decisions and closed loop recovery systems. An, an important part of this evolution was the understanding that C and D facilities were often asked to provide project teams with minimum recovery rates of 65% or higher. San Francisco adopted a regulatory framework that required all C and D facilities to be registered with the city and have their recovery rates verified by a third party. The result has been diversion rates for mixed C and D processing generally falling below the 65% threshold. Therefore, in order for construction projects in San Francisco to meet minimum recovery requirements, they need to work with facilities to deliver source separated materials. One example of this effort is the recycling of gypsum drywall in a return to manufacturer program. San Francisco has already partnered with pilot projects and our facility network to support this model with positive results. Power Recycle is uniquely situated to advance these efforts through its partnership and influence across the state. We hope Power Recycle explores funding mechanisms to support facilities to invest in source separated material recovery programs like the gypsum return to manufacturing effort. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, participating today. Uh, next up, I'm going to ask Paul Lee to unmute. And next up is uh, the, the caller with the last four digits, 2724. So Paul Lee, go ahead, unmute yourself, state your name and affiliation if you'd like to make a comment. All right, next up is going to be uh, 2724. I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute, um, state your affiliation, make your comment. Hello, thank you. My name is Janice Schroeder, and I'm a core member of the West Berkeley Alliance for Clean Air and Safe Jobs, a grassroots organization. And the Alliance is also a member of the California Environmental Justice Coalition. I became involved with the struggle for uh, reducing air pollution in 1980 and continue to be actively involved in that. I'm calling today to urge you to reject approval of the H cycle plan to build five incinerators which will burn green waste and make it into hydrogen. I'm calling for you to reject that approval until there is further analysis and an additional EIR done. The additional environmental impact report is needed to assess the potential harms and impacts and also including environmental justice impacts to already overburdened communities. Uh, communities that will be impacted by an H cycle facility have not given their input. This facility is a transformation facility and what is proposed to be burned, this is my big concern, what is proposed to be burned will release extremely toxic hazardous air polluting emissions. Therefore, I urge that more analysis be done and is needed before the department can determine that the technology will be a reduction in landfill emissions comparable to composting. Thank you very much for taking my comments. Thank you, Ms. Schroeder, for uh, your participation today. Appreciate your comments. All right, next I'm going to ask caller 3911 to unmute, and then next will be caller 3352. All right, go ahead, 3911, with your name and affiliation. Oh, thank you. This is Heidi Sanborn. I'm with the National Stewardship Action Council. We are an advocate for an equitable and circular economy. 
and I have uh, I think four things I'd like to touch on real quickly. One is um, support for the H cycle project. We normally align with a lot of the environmental groups that signed on to the letter, but we have a climate emergency and we need to get these organics managed in California. And so we're excited to see a project that's going to help the local community. And we want to thank all those people who came all the way from the Bay Area to speak. It was very moving. Um, and to provide a just transition for the people that want to continue to work, but just you know need to find jobs outside of oil and gas. So again, there's no silver bullet, there's only silver buckshot. And this is a great project to, to cut our teeth on and we really encourage um, that su and support the H cycle project. Um, the next one is the bifurcation. We want to support John Kennedy's comment. And uh, I believe it was Christy Abreu as well said this, that we don't know how this is going to work with bifurcation of the organics. There's so much cost already and burden on the local government. Um, we just don't think that's going to work. Uh, we'd like to also comment on the carpet. And we want to thank Cal Recycle for the uh, disapproval of this um, contingency plan. It was a very thoughtful analysis, and it's taken a lot of staff time, I'm sure, to, to review and provide all the comments. But that contingency plan was actually required by a bill that we sponsored, AB 729 in 2019 by David Chu, as a response to CARE's unsatisfactory performance, including multiple plan disapprovals and fines for noncompliance, as well as the need to put in safeguards to ensure that the residents have uninterrupted access to the program should another entity need to step in and take over for the implementation of the project program. Even when the requirements are clearly spelled out in statute, CARE still manages to submit inadequate plans, which is befuddling to us. Moreover, through the contingency plan amendment, there are multiple references to CalRecycle having a contract with CARE or paying CARE for its consultation which quite frankly, we find offensive after a decade plus of failure to act, we feel in good faith requiring CalRecycle to spend an outsized amount of time overseeing this visible fee program. This is not the kind of EPR we want. We wanna see internalized costs. And we'd like to suggest that care con uh, contact product care or any other successful stewardship program to get some help in implementing this program and the contingency plan. Since CARE has once again failed to meet the standards of the law, we're sad to say, but we do support the director's decision to disapprove the contingency plan and hope that um, they will get some help complying since they seem to have a consistent problem doing so. Regarding CND, I want to support the San Francisco comments. We've been working with multiple stakeholders regarding CND and more specifically gypsum recycling, but have concerns that date back to June of 2021 when the statewide recycling commission, which I chaired, adopted a recommendation on CND. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, concern around the reporting this, and we feel that third party certifications are very important to ensure accuracy. Uh, we think the diversion rates are higher than actually that they should be. Um, and so we'd like to see some sort of funding, especially to pilot gypsum recycling because we have uh, gypsum manufacturers in the Bay Area and LA, and several of them are very eager to get more clean gypsum back for recycling and use a new board, but they need some help. Um, so uh, we would like to see CalRecycle consider some, some funding for that. And uh, lastly, we would like to support Bob Davidouk's comments that, you know, it's always good to have um, good public uh, meetings and, and lots of good discussion like we've had here today. Uh, before rate structures are imposed that might cause undue uh, burden on different businesses. It's a very complicated time and lots of market changes. So we want to wish everybody also happy holidays. It's been a very long year, a lot of hard work for everybody, especially Cal Recycle. So thank you so much for allowing me to make the comments and wishing you happy holidays and new year. Happy holidays, Heidi. Thank you so much for uh, your, uh, as always, uh, thoughtful um, comments. Have a very, very happy holiday. Uh,
Thank you. Uh, caller last four digits 3352. State your name and affiliation. Caller number 7954. You're up next. Yeah, this is, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is John X. Mataka. I'm with the Grayson Neighborhood Council. I'm here to oppose the H cycle proposal. Our community is a disadvantaged community in Grayson, California. We were home to the Wesley Tire incinerator. We currently have one of two garbage incinerators in Crow's Landing. We have had these proposals, these so-called clean technology proposals, thrown at us, and they're not clean at all. It's greenwashing. Hydrogen is new. There's been explosions in Bakersfield and in Ohio. We, don't, we have two proposals. The Stanislaus County Board of Supervisors is planning at the Crow's Landing Naval Base some form of this hydrogen thing over there. And there's a company called Emeritus in Riverbank, communities of color who historically have had uh, pollution issues, and that's the areas. These are not going to be in, 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 in white neighborhoods. Let's call it like it is. These are going to be in the same disadvantaged communities. You need, we need community hearings uh, by Cal Recycle to come out to our communities and to give us notice so we can get people to these meetings to really talk about how this is going to affect our communities. We're tired of coming in with this so-called new technology. I know labor is for this. Labor is for all jobs. I'm, I'm, I'm a labor person for years. All my jobs have been labor jobs. I understand their want for jobs, but I would just caution them to say that a lot of times it comes on, you can build it and like that, but let's see how long you stay on those jobs with this new technology. Now, the other thing I, I just want to say is we want community meetings in all of these five locations, or excuse me, uh, I think it's eight facilities are planned. We should have community meetings, Cal Recycle come out, organize those, and, have, and we'll do the getting people there, and let's really have a talk. Nobody's came out to our community to tell us about what was proposed. And when we go to the county and the city meetings, you know, we get turned the deaf ear. And the other thing I'll say, and I'll close, is I find it really interesting that some of the callers, uh, like um, uh, Joe from L.A. and Mark Williams uh, from, the, from the Bay Area, were asked to contact you guys and talk to you guys later, but you didn't ask Nick Lapis, who was against it, to call and talk to you, and I seriously doubt that you'll want to talk to me. Thank you for your time. Well, actually, I was going to ask that you submit your contact information directly to uh, Cal Recycle and to our environmental justice um, office um, as well. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, Nick, I'm more than happy to ask. Uh, uh, Nick is uh, um, a regular communicator with the department and, um, and uh, is here in Sacramento often. And so... Um, he knows that he can always reach out uh, to us. And so uh, just to clarify, um, we are in regular communication with uh, Nick when he's here. But um, thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. And it, it is not, um, that is very much to the purpose of having this public meeting um, where we are, uh, and and, and why we have um, additionally had the simulcast and have been able to expand our simulcast now to have phone in so that we are able to bring um, members from every California community into our meeting to, and to have these comments. So thank you for your comment and for participating. Um, caller with the last four digits, 7954. Please state your name and affiliation and public comment. Up next is gonna be caller 8174, but um, 7954, please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Bianca Lopez. Um, I am a community member here in Stanislaus County. Um, I wanted to say I, I appreciate John's the last uh, comments um, that were made. It, it is. It does seem um, like this is 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 a rigged system. Um, often we've we've communicated with Cal Recycle as well, along with many organizations who have reached out to Cal Recycle about these false solutions like Ape Cycle's proposal. Um, and they know that we care about this. They know that we're a grassroots organization um, and they put these things on the agenda and don't reach out. Um, so it, these, th these processes 
are intended to leave community voices out. Fortunately, there are some uh, community organizations who are uh, backed by industry who are able to attend and participate in, in such uh, as today. Um, but as a grassroots organizer here in San Jose County, uh, I want to share uh, some of our perspective uh, with these fall solutions. We have one of the last operating uh, waste to energy incinerator. The other one is in Long Beach, and actually it's soon to shut down because it's no longer economically feasible. Um, it will end, their contract ends in, at the end of January of next year. The Stanislaus Covanta incinerator is in a disadvantaged community, predominantly Latino, Spanish speaking, farm worker community. Since 1988, Covanta has regularly emitted numerous harmful pollutants, including nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxides, particulate matter, ammonia, and lead, among other toxic materials, and hexavalent chromium. Covanta is one of the leading stationary sources of air pollution in our community. According to EPA's enforcement database, Covanta Stanislaus has had a high priority violation of its air permit requirements for the last four quarters. In addition, the facility exceeded emission limits for nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxide, and carbon monoxide in March 2020, and exceeded nitrogen oxide and carbon monoxide emission limits again in August of 2020. As our community has been fighting this incinerator for over 20 years, this year, we were successful at producing a zero waste plan through community engagement that has implemented a true just transition from waste to energy to community-based, community-led programs that has the potential to create true local and well-paying jobs and promote community-owned businesses. As we continue to fight against this incinerator, we learn about other technologies that are being proposed to our local government and the state that are unfortunately led by fossil fuel industries like Chevron and Exxon, which also pin communities of color and unions against each other, as we see here today. We want jobs, we want just transitions, but we don't want to compromise our health and, our and the future of our children. We have to have some, some standards, right? Eight cycle has previously proposed eight facilities in the state of California, and two of them are proposed to come to the Central Valley where our communities have been overburdened by not just oil refineries and oil extraction, but also from other fossil fuel products like pesticides that have contaminated our air, our water, our food systems, and our health. We urge you to reject eight cycles application for the proposed hydrogen facility based on these compelling concerns. It's a cru it is crucial to prioritize the well-being of our communities, adhere to environmental justice principles, and ensure transparent and thorough evaluations of technologies with potential environmental and public health impacts. The underlying premise that H cycles technology provides greater greenhouse gas reductions than composting lacks substantiation. The latest application fails to provide comprehensive data supporting this claim, raising questions about the completeness or in, of information and analysis. Crucial issues related to emissions, soil health, carbon sequestration, and material streams must be thoroughly addressed before any approval is considered. Our skepticism regarding the viability and success of H cycles proposed waste gasification process is grounded in a track record of high profile failures, safety concerns, and financial losses associated with similar high temperature thermal processing. Reports on waste to hydrogen technologies further highlight potential environmental risks and inefficiencies. Approving eight cycles technology could set a dangerous precedent leading California down a potential harmful path of high temperature incineration and waste to energy approaches. Drawing parallels with the European Union shift away from incineration due to pollution concerns we caution against adopting technologies with substantial environmental and public health risks. We firmly believe that additional analysis is imperative before the department can reasonably determine that age cycles technology offers a reduction in landfill emissions comparable to composting. A more comprehensive environment, environmental impact analysis is necessary before granting approval for the proposed technology use. I am a mother of two boys. 
My son, my oldest son, who's six, and I have asthma. I live in Riverbank, where right next to a super fun site. Our communities are tired. We're literally dying. As people on, on the ground are expressing today from Richmond, from the Bay Area, that is true of all people of color, low income communities in the state of California and across the country. We cannot keep buying into these false solutions just because they promise jobs. Well paying jobs are great, but at what expense? These systems are not vetted properly. They will still emit emissions and they will continue to kill us because of Chevron and Exxon who are backing these practices and we're falling, falling for it. Ya basta, not in my community, not in my backyard, not in my hood, for the sake of my health and the health of my children and the children of my children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lopez, for your participation today. We appreciate um, your comments. And if you wouldn't mind uh, reaching out to the, to the, the um, department directly with your comments, that would be helpful as well as we continue our conversations. Um, thank you. Up next is caller 8174. I'll ask you to unmute, state your uh, name, affiliation, and comment. And up next is caller 2450. So 8174, please go ahead if you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon and happy holidays. My name is Melinda Andrade, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Association of California Recycling Industries, ACRI. ACRI represents businesses that are committed to protecting the rights of independent recyclers and promoting free market competition for recyclable materials. Thank you for allowing me to comment today. First, I want to acknowledge the new processing payments that were released this week. ACRI supported SB 353 and the updates released show the success of this effort to better cover the cost of recycling PEG plastics in the current market. We look forward to the continued success of this updated formula and thank you. Next, I would like to speak to the proposed no change in commingle rates. For ACRI members, this will be problematic. It needs to be changed without delay. With changes to the recycling program defined in SB 1013 and SB 353, we believe curbside operators, MRFs, and other collection programs and buybacks will see significant increases in commingled products. We are asking the department to conduct a commingled rate study in the first quarter of next year to ensure the state's recycling partners, like our members, are accurately compensated for any commingled materials collected. We respectfully request an opportunity to meet with the department to discuss these imminent impacts further. And finally, we're asking the department to postpone action on the Recycling Innovation Grant Program this winter until CalRecycle can convene further stakeholder workshops. We believe feedback from our association and other industry stakeholders would provide valuable insight when looking at areas of investment in, in the industry and existing recycling infrastructure. ACRI is committed to being a partner for the department. We would like to be a resource in your success. Our board of directors and members would be glad to meet with the department or share written feedback given the opportunity. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for your comments. And we, uh, if you wouldn't mind sending those directly to the BCRP um, as well, that would be very helpful. Thank you so much for participating. Up next is caller 2450, followed by caller 6171. Um, so caller 2450, please state your name, affiliation, and comment. Yeah, I Hi, this is Bob Davidouk, and I made the comments um, right after Cliff post. So I'm I'm finished. Got it. Thank you. All right. So caller six one seven one. I'm going to ask you to unmute. You're going to be followed by caller seven two five zero. Hello. Yes. Thank you. Emily Garcia with Natural Resources Defense Council, calling on behalf of thousands of members across the state to express our great concern for the decision being made about age cycle. We don't believe the application has met the criteria required for approval, and options one is not consistent with the statute or regulations, and further analysis is needed to determine the negative impacts on the environment and public health. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. All right, up next will be caller 7250, um, followed by uh, Melinda Adadre, who I uh, believe already spoke, and then followed by 2168. So call number 7250, please state your name and your comment. 
Yes, thank you. This is Alice Trulov with the Biodegradable Products Institute, or BPI. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, first, uh, we'd like to disagree with the determination that bifurcation is not feasible. I think it's worth noting that almost 40% of the respondents agreed with us, responding that bifurcation was feasible. Um, I want to stress, though, I heard composters today, and we understand that bifurcation could be expensive. Um, and so I'd like to establish a couple things. One, that composters wouldn't be forced to bifurcate if determined feasible. And second, we and others fought for funding through SB 54, including such that our members, makers of certified compostable products, would pay fees towards compost processing. So very much putting our money where our mouth is. And so we were disappointed that those funding opportunities weren't divulged in the survey and that composters may have responded differently had they known. Uh, we're also disappointed that no clear threshold for determining bifurcation feasibility was ever established. So it's a little unclear to us how the determination was made. We'd love clarification there. Um, I also wanted to respond directly to Director Wagoner. You talked about compost inputs providing value to the finished compost um, to create a high quality product. And we agree with you. At BPI, we uh, test our products rigorously for disintegration and biodegradation and ecotoxicity and a PFAS scheme that has served as the basis for state laws across the country now. It's also why we filed a petition to the National Organics Program to allow compostable products to be allowable inputs for organic ag so that composters in California can maximize their diversion and get higher prices for their product. Um, so let's talk value. Compostable products have been shown to help divert tons of food waste that would otherwise go to landfills and create methane. I think that's value right there. We also know from studies that compostable products can provide beneficial structure in piles. That's something I've heard directly from composters and they don't negatively affect the nutrient content of finished compost that's been studied as well. Um, the one other thing I wanna mention is that the bifurcation study perpetuates what we fear is a habitual misidentification of contaminants. We believe a thousand percent that composters correctly identify contamination as a concern and they don't intentionally misinform, but we know that there's no reliable way to identify the composition of contaminants in compost without laboratory characterization. And without it, contaminants may be assumed to be compostable, which perpetuates a false assumption that those materials don't break down in compost conditions, despite all of the laboratory and field testing to the positive. And we actually know that this is routinely the case because we've conducted over-testing um, that identified contaminants that were thought to be compostable plastic, but were non-compostable plastic. This has happened over and over. Um, and so we hope that CalRecycle reconsidered this determination and equally as important um, that any future data collection inform such, that, in, that informs such determinations rely on more scientific means. Because again, we believe that compostable products provide value and then that's been shown again and again, especially compared to non-compostable counterparts that are known contaminants and generators of microplastics and finished compost. Um, but we wanna be clear, value is determined by science and not perception. And we are of course more than happy to talk. We would you know, wanna have an open dialogue with CalRecycle and we, we hope to soon. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Happy holidays. Thank you so much and appreciate the comments and your participation. Happy holidays. Next is caller 2168. Please unmute your mic, state your affiliation, go ahead. That's going to be call, followed by caller 0872. But 2168, please go ahead. Good morning, Director Wagner and the other esteemed members of CalRecycle. My name is Paul Bahu and I am president of Global Plastics Recycling. We are a PET wash line located in Paris, California though we've all spoken before and know each other. I hope all is well with you during this holiday season. As for me, my business is struggling. Like before, my comments are in regards to the PMDP program. For those who don't know what that is, the PMDP payments are an incentive structure meant to keep California's recycled PET bottles in state to be processed into finished goods. So, as I've mentioned in the past, we all need to work together, CalRecycle and the state's recycling stakeholders. We all want the same thing, a functional and successful circular economy for PET consumer packaging. CalRecycle even mentioned as much an hour ago, you want a circular economy, I want a circular economy, the people want a circular economy. It's one of the few things people can largely get behind in this age of strife and division. Yet here we are, unable to connect the dots. As my colleague Bob Daviduk from Our Planet Earth mentioned, the whole thing is resting on shaky ground right now. The economy isn't great, a wet winter last year wrecked California's berry harvest, leading to decreased demand and cheap imports are flooding in from East Asia. Those imports, mind you, are being sold at less than our domestic industry's cost of production. Every company from recycling centers to manufacturers are feeling it. And we've been feeling it ever since September of 2022. We've been collectively limping along for five quarters. 
You've heard a lot of people talk about it and uh, we're still in it. So in the last three months, I've had to lay off over 40% of my workforce. The other wash line reclaimers are no different, having instituted massive layoffs to contend with the constricted avenues still available to us. Sunoco, one of the biggest companies in this ecosystem, even closed their Exeter plant two months ago, taking with them California jobs and opportunities for end markets. When I asked them why they were closing their plant, the answer I received was imports. In addition, Republic Services just opened their wash line plant in Las Vegas. We now have to contend with another player in the market who has advantages over California businesses. This company will be going up directly against California wash lines, and yet CalRecycle's new PMDP guidelines make sheet and thermoforming end users even less likely to buy our flakes, as their incentive payments have been cut. I struggle to understand the rationale behind short paying these companies. As I have stated in the past, the PMDP program is the only way of leveling the playing field outside of President Biden changing his Trans-Pacific Trade Policy. Now, I seem to have lost his phone number. Perhaps you guys can give him a call and ask on our behalf. If not, here we are. The house is on fire and PMDP is the fire hose. Yet rather than target that money towards the blaze, the funding, which was pro procured through reclaimer lobbying, seems largely to be pointed at the perfectly fine house next door. The bottlers are an integral part of the closed loop system, yet they are in no danger of closing their doors. If that's so, why then is the majority of the PMDP funding being funneled towards them? The $150 per ton payment is about seven to eight cents per pound in real terms. Yet the current distance between imported resident and California's RPET material is close to 20 cents a pound. It's a math problem that doesn't pencil out. As it is laid out, I do not believe that this new structure will help and in fact may harm the recycling ecosystem in California further. I humbly request a time where we can all get in the same room and try to hash out some collaborative solution. Okay. If it's in the state's interest for a circular economy to exist, then it is in the state's interest to ensure that one third of that loop doesn't disintegrate before our eyes. This is not hyperbole. I have zero post-consumer wash flake orders through the rest of the year. Zero. Imagine that. That has never happened in the history of me doing business in this industry, yet here we are. A lot has been mentioned during this meeting about funding rural collection and how to address that issue. But what's the point if there's nobody left to process those bottles once collected? Director Wagner, please, I'm asking you, help us. We need the PMDP funds, uh, funding towards reclaimers to increase. It's bad out here. So that all being said, I have some questions in regards to the new PMDP guidelines. I'm going to read them off all at once, and if you can answer them, that'd be great. So number one is that 40 million allocated for PMDP only for the calendar year of 2024 for two years or through 2027. Question number two, are the payment amounts in each tier allocated to equal quarterly payments or first come first served until they are exhausted? Number three, under reclaimer tier three, uh, is this in reference to HDPE caps and PP labels? And if so, do California PET reclaimers get any incentive payment for selling their cap and label material to California-based HDPE and PP processors? Uh, my fourth question was about, uh, you know, why we didn't, why uh, no input was sought from stakeholders. But uh, between Mark Murray and everyone else asking, I think uh, that that, that uh, point uh, came across. So um, I'll leave it at that. Once again, I hope to work together in the near future. I really see an opportunity to do some great things. Happy holidays to everyone at Cal Recycle, and thank you for hearing me out. Hi, Paul, this is Amy. Thank you very much for your um, comments. Um, so the, the money is first come, first serve for the tiered system. It is not like the current methodology of splitting the pie equally per ton until the tiers run out and we are committed to updating um, participants with the balance of the tier every quarter. Um, your second question, or your first question was about the time. This was um, to meet with the statute uh, deadline of June, I believe it's July 1st, 2026. Um, so two years. Um, thank you for your comments. I need to check in with staff about your HDPE and th that question. And um, thank you for your other comments. 
Um, next up is going to be caller 0872, followed by 2101. So 0872, please go ahead. Hi, yes, this is Jeanette Hanna uh, commenting on AB 1201 on behalf of BASF, which has nine facilities and 300 employees in the state of California. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on bifurcation. We agree with the comments from BPI and wish to highlight a few points we made in our written comments. We note that the survey conducted by CalRecycle shows that bifurcation is possible based on composter response. While there are costs involved, funding from SB 54 will go to supporting any additional costs incurred by composters who choose to accept and process certified compostable products. We highlight that there is no mandate for any composter to accept certified compostable products nor participate in a bifurcated program. It has been shown that the use of organic waste collection bags, for example, reduce contamination and increase participation in residential organics diversion programs. It does not make sense to prohibit a composting company from accepting compostable products if they wish to do so by directly prohibiting a compostability claim. We hope that CalRecycle will accept this data and agree that bifurcation is possible so that composters and residents have options uh, for tools that help divert organics from landfill and achieve California's climate goals. We ask that CalRecycle not look backward at existing limitations for composting and certified compostable products. We ask that instead, we all look forward together using any tools that are useful um, and available to us for creating robust solutions for a sustainable future in California. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, lastly, we're gonna have callers 2101, then 6414, and the final caller is 7068. So caller 2101, please go ahead. Yes, hello, this is Jane Williams. I'm the Executive Director of California Communities Against Toxics. I'm here to testify on the H cycle issue. So California has not relied on incineration as a waste management strategy, except for at two of its facilities for many decades now. And the reason is because we have some of the worst air pollution in the country. Um, the PM 2.5 and PM 10 air pollution in California is some of the worst in the world, as well as some of the ozone levels and the um, other other kinds of NAAQS problems that we've got, national ambient air quality standards. And so it's going to be extraordinarily difficult for us as a matter of public policy to trade methane emissions from landfills and try to say that putting particulate matter and NOx and other ozone precursors into the air is going to be a solution for um, green waste compost, what should be green waste composting. Um, I, I find it just, you know, extraordinary that we're, we're in this position largely due to the outdated warm model um, to say that combustion of waste is going to be a solution as a matter of public policy to any waste problem in California. So I want to urge CalRecycle to rethink um, what, it, what it's doing here. You know that these facilities are going to go into environmental justice communities, um, more wealthy, more um, well-off communities just won't accept them. Um, they are incinerators. It doesn't matter if you're making it into hydrogen and using the uh, advanced hydrogen credits in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, they're still going to be considered incinerators for the purposes of the Federal Clean Air Act and they're going to have to comply with Section 129. And so, um, again, I urge Recycle to, CalRecycle to, to rethink this and to be extremely mindful of where these facilities are going to be cited. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to this issue today. Thank you so much, Ms. Williams, for your participation today. Caller 6414, uh, please go ahead. Uh, yes, hello, everybody. You hear me? Yep. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Wagner, everyone there. Uh, my name is Tom Helm. I'm the co-founder of Valley Improvement Projects, a social and environmental justice group in the northern San Joaquin Valley. Um, also calling for CalRecycle to reject uh, H-Cycle's application uh, in strong agreement with the last commenter about combustion uh, as a strategy to deal with our waste and the pollution uh, in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, where I live, a non-attainment region uh, for air pollutants. I agree with, with comments made early on in the meeting about uh, the fact that uh, the analysis done is assuming that 
uh, diesel um, trucks um, would not be used if it not for the hydrogen created here. There's other ways um, to do that. Uh, I agree also with comments that the original uh, EIR did not look at this hydrogen technology and a, a new full EIR is needed. Um, I agree uh, with the comment that uh, there has been a lack of community outreach um, around um, this issue. Um, I know that our organization and other EJ groups have reached out um, about um, this particular application um, and, and have not heard back. Uh, a number of environmental justice groups that we work with um, have been working on um, a, a very slim, acceptable way to use uh, only green hydrogen you, uh, made from truly renewable energy in a very limited use. Um, the H cycle model does not meet that standard. Um, we don't want biomass combustion, municipal waste combustion, no increasing of pollution in disadvantaged communities, um, and no gasification. Um, we are a community based environmental justice group. I was raised here in Stanislaus County where we started the organization. We've been around for over 10 years. We're home to one of the last two trash incinerators in the state of California. Um, we've been working very hard the last 10 years um, to move our local bodies away from uh, combustion to deal with waste uh, and actually implement uh, a zero waste plan that can be a model for the state because the area is having uh, to be reliant on this incinerator um, since uh, the 80s. Um, and we feel that uh, a waste to hydrogen type facility could re incentivize the production of more waste. Uh, that has been a great concern for us that's come with the incinerator. Uh, maybe a reason why the city of Modesto here in Stanislaus was without curbside recycling for 30 years while recyclable material um, went to be uh, burned at the for profit incinerator that required 800 tons of waste every day to maximize uh, their profit. Um, back in uh, the 80s, uh, that technology was also sold as this new technology pollution um, to waste um, uh, here, and, and and what we got was less recycling and more pollution in a disadvantaged community. It's nearly 80 percent uh, Latino farm worker communities, as was planned by the Sorrell report uh, before that incinerator was built, which is if you want to put these facilities somewhere, uh, you put them in rural areas where uh, English is the not the first language spoken, where, where education rates and poverty rates um, uh, where education rates are low, poverty rates are high, people that work in ranching, mining, and farming, um, even mentioning Catholic communities, basically describing these Latino farm worker communities without coming out and saying it. And then a year after that report comes out, uh, they decide to build the incinerator. And we're worried that these, the same legacy of environmental racism, now that there's already a facility there, will just be an area to, to keep putting uh, the newest facility, the newest thing that's being greenwashed and called a new clean technology. Um, um, back, um, we we do support uh, all the points of many of the community members that were made earlier about being tired of being poisoned by fossil fuels um, in their communities. Um, we, we relate to that, uh, but I, I would just ask who's behind this new technology? Um, it is it is the oil companies. It's or it's businesses like Chevron um, that are behind this. It's it's their new way of greenwashing themselves so they continue to operate, continue to make money. And I don't know how you can trust an oil company after the decades long um, uh, deceit uh, and greed that they've shown. Um, and but but I do think that those community members uh, have their heart in the right place as. As like was said about others, I just happen to disagree um, on this point that that the solution to our communities is uh, is hydrogen. Like was mentioned earlier, where explosions have already happened in disadvantaged communities in the San Joaquin Valley, like in Bakersfield, where they are uh, experimenting on us with all of these unproven new technologies like hydrogen and and carbon capture and and biofuels. Uh, we also support labor as well. We like to see an investment in zero waste jobs that can create a large amount of jobs. Uh, but California is choosing to invest uh, in, in hydrogen and these other false solutions. 
Um, th this is just money coming from government investment, so they can choose to invest it um, somewhere else. Um, and one last point about uh, projects, we are a founding the California Environmental Justice Coalition. We have over 80 small grassroots community-based organizations uh, from all around the state. Dozens of them are in the Bay Area. Um, none that I am aware of support this project. Um, none uh, join uh, organizations like Arches, uh, which is the state and uh, hydrant uh, industries working together. Uh, none of them have uh, directors or leadership that used to work uh, for the Department of Energy or for uh, the governor's office in, in offices um, cultivating uh, relationships between uh, government and, and industry like hydrogen. Um, so uh, feel free to definitely reach out um, to me if you'd like to speak with environmental justice groups um, and who have an opinion on this matter. I thank you for your time. Um, thank, thank, you. thank you so much for the comment. We have caller 7068 and then followed by a new caller 9554. So caller 7068, please go ahead. Hey, uh, this is John Davis. I administer the Mojave Desert and Mountain Recycling Authority in San Bernardino County. And I just want to follow up on uh, comments about the curbside um, uh, commingled rate. Um, you know, freezing the CRV percentage on glass through 2024 is, uh, just doesn't seem, it seem like a good idea. We've been looking forward to um, uh, beginning to get some added benefit for recycling glass, which is a, a huge cost um, at the Victor Valley MRF. It's a publicly owned MRF, so we're, we're well aware of uh, what it's costing now and uh, the inclusion of uh, wine and spirits gave us hope that we'd begin to get some relief for our ratepayers. Uh, um, so, you know, we may, there may, may well be uh, volume change over the next year, um, but to assume that there's going to be a change in the proportion of wine and spirits class just doesn't, <laughs> doesn't sit well. Um, you know, work out the, uh, your, your rate studies, uh, going forward, but uh, please help us. Um, I also want to, uh, our MRF separates PET thermal farms. We're one of the, the MRFs in California that does that. And uh, I hope that you can find a way to um, adjust the curbside payments for those clean bales that uh, that are being sent for, for bottle to bottle recycling. Um, you know who the MRFs are that did it. There was uh, incentive payments back in 22. So it's easy enough to uh, to identify uh, both the, the process that you used at that time and also the facilities uh, that have a, a much higher percentage of um, CRV containers in those bales. So uh, uh, thanks for listening. I know it's been a long meeting. Thanks. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, next is caller 9554, followed by 5270, and we have a new caller joining the line as well. So next up, 9554, please go ahead. Good afternoon. This is Neil Edgar. I'm the executive director of the California Compost Coalition. I wanted to weigh in on the AB 1201 bifurcation determination. A number of callers have alluded to the fact that it's possible to bifurcate this waste stream and collect an organic stream with packaging that's not organic or non-organic program or national organic program compliant versus non-organic program compliant. And, and that's all well and good that there's some mythical opportunity to create a possible system at some distant future. But the fact is you need to weigh in with the determination on what's occurring current packaging that's being sold into the state the composting infrastructure that is being asked to deal with this packaging, currently packaging is distributed is largely unidentifiable. It's indistinguishable as whether it's compostable or non-compostable. It's certainly not identifiable as to what's national organic program compliant versus non-organic program compliant. 
And feasible means that there are significant economic, environmental, social, and technological implications that would have to be overcome. Um, reasonable, reasonable costs in all of those aspects that would have to be agreed upon can occur in a successful manner in a, in a, in a reasonable amount of time. And that just doesn't seem to be the case, given the exorbitant costs that are being absorbed already for organic collection systems that are managing one-way stream, putting additional trucks on the street, the fuel costs, the labor costs, the environmental costs are completely overwhelming uh, to implement an additional collection system to, to take that on at this point in time. So, uh, busy day. I'm happy to wrap up with those comments and look forward to seeing your determination. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edgar, for your additional comments. Next up is caller 5270, followed by the uh, current final caller 7663. So uh, caller 5270, please go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Bradley Angel, and I am the Executive Director of Green Action for Health and Environmental Justice. And our organization, we are based in frontline communities that are impacted by environmental injustice environmental racism, and health disparities. And these are communities that Cal EPA and, you know, through Cal Virus Screen and other, uh, you know, analytical, uh, uh, you know, the facts are disproportionately impacted by pollution, are targeted for polluting facility we would never see in rich white communities. And H-Cycle's proposal is more of the same that communities of color and working class communities have seen for decades. Uh, as my colleague Tom Helm from Valley Improvement Projects and the California Environmental Justice Coalition really pointed out in wonderful comments that I won't take your time to repeat, but we endorse all of them. The fact is that these technologies, which we've been tracking for years now, generally don't work, pollute, are disincentives for real solutions, and are not safe. And I want to point out that California EPA and Cal Recycle have environmental justice policies. They talk a lot about environmental justice. There's even some groups at the meeting today claiming they are environmental justice. But you need to hear from the communities and follow the, um, you know, the call from frontline communities where people are dying, people are sick from pollution, and it's continuing. So if Cal EPA and Cal Recycle really want to uphold your mandate and your mission to comply with environmental health and justice, reject H-Cycle's application for health and justice. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Angel. I'm the final caller, 7663, please go ahead. Uh, yes, my name is Monica Wilson. I'm calling in from Gaia, the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives. We're a global network based in California. Um, and I think I've met many of you over the years. I really want to um, echo Bradley's comments just now. Um, we have seen over and over across California and across the country that BIPOC communities get targeted by incinerators, by gasification, by these types of high heat technologies which cause pollution, um, which don't prevent the problem, but actually create a new problem. And the idea that our methane action to be built on combustion um, is not a climate solution. That is, um, that's a scam, frankly. So, um, I, you know, we've all submitted comments. So those of us who are concerned about this idea that methane action and keeping methane um, out of the atmosphere to be replaced by burning something have all submitted multiple comments um, on a cycle over the past year. So I won't repeat all of that, but I just want to sum it up. We, we can't be destroying natural resources to address SB 1383, that was never the intent. We need to compost, we need to return nutrients to the soil, we need to prevent food waste in the first place and building new burners across the state for a, uh, a non-existent hydrogen economy, um, frankly, is a boondoggle that I think we should be embarrassed um, that we're even considering right now when there are so many, so many better, safer, healthier, 
more sustainable options already on the table, already being practiced across, across California. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you um, participating. Was that still the last comment? That's it for calls, yes. Okay, we have a couple more comments uh, back here in the room. Thank you. Again, Julia Levin with the Bioenergy Association of California. And I'm now speaking as a former commissioner from the California Energy Commission uh, because so many commenters, I think, misunderstand the technology that H-Cycle is using. If you go to the California Energy Commission website, there is a very clear definition of pyrolysis. And in that definition, which is consistent with the U.S. Department of Energy's definition and the International Energy Agency, pyrolysis is a high temperature thermal chemical reaction that happens in the absence of air or oxygen. And I want to underscore in the absence of air or oxygen, you simply cannot have, it is physically impossible to have combustion, also known as incineration, in the absence of air or oxygen. So pyrolysis and combustion or incineration or burning, whatever pejorative term you want to use, and I agree, we shouldn't be combusting waste of any kind. So we should all agree to that. But pyrolysis is physically incompatible. It is mutually exclusive with incineration or combustion. And I urge CalRecycle and everyone who is concerned about incineration or combustion of trash to look at the California Energy Commission website even better, look at the U.S. Department of Energy website. There's a very clear explanation of why neither pyrolysis nor gasification are the same as combustion. But pyrolysis in particular, because it is defined by happening in the absence of air or oxygen, it's really important that people understand what the technology is before commenting on it. And this is a very clear distinction here. So I just wanted to add that, and I, I urge everyone involved go to the expert technology agencies to see what the definitions of these technologies are. Pyrolysis is not combustion, period. Thank you. Evan Edgar, Edgar Associates on behalf of the California Compost Coalition. We represent most of the organic composters in California, mostly using clean food, clean green waste, and certified organic. You heard Christy Pistoni talk about her 30 years of experience getting certified by OMRI, getting certified by CDFA, so we are the organic industry that really care about soil health. We also represent all, most of the independent MRF operators in, in the state. And the independent MRF operators create these MRF residuals. And if you follow your staff report on waste characterization over the last three years, the amount of MRF residuals has increased by about 3 million tons over three years, partly due to the China stored, partly due to all the wishful recycling that kind of makes it through the system. So. Um, so we're here today to support the H-Cycle um, application in order to um, take these MRF residuals, or basically the recycling of last resort. Um, they have nowhere else to go. Um, Cal Recycle is embarking upon a zero waste plan. As part of that zero waste plan, you got to look at all materials. And MRF residuals not only have gone through one process that would end up in the landfill otherwise, once the H-Cycle application takes that material, they go through another MRF residual to remove a lot of other contamination. So it's two MRF process. So I'm here today representing soil health in order to not have these MRF residuals go to compost. The California Compost Coalition does not want MRF residuals. You cannot compost it. It's bad for soil health. And if you look in the room at the people I represent, I'm not here representing big oil at all. I'm here representing big soil because big soil is, is what we need in order to um, have natural working lands and have the carbon sink out there. So you heard so many people talk about, about today about um, soil health. The Compost Coalition believes in that quite well. So on behalf of the California Compost Coalition, we support the H-Cycle application. Thank you. Mr. Edgar, Ms. Levin, thank you for the additional comments. Thank you all for your very, very thoughtful participation today and all of the thoughtful comments. As per usual, I am really impressed with the stakeholders that are involved in Cal Recycle business and how thoughtful and respectful you uh, participate um, with those on the other side of an issue. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for all of the comments that will very much go into the consideration of all of these issues as we move forward. And with that, I will wish everyone a very happy, happy holiday. 
and uh, holiday season, excuse me, and uh, we will see you in the new year.